Good evening, everyone. So we welcome you all to another edition of the Difficult Scenarios in ENT Practice. This is a webinar series uh, which has been jointly run by GSK and Indian Academy of Otolaryngology and Head and Neck Surgery. And uh, this, this time, our discussion will be on the basic skills in laminar concepts in face and uh, we'll be talking about difficult scenarios in endoscopic sinus surgery. We have a keynote speaker, Dr. Kazuhiro Omura from Japan, and we have a panel of uh, eminent panelists from all over India. Uh, who, who will be the panel will be moderated by Dr. Binod Felix from Trivandrum, who again is a renowned skull base and ENT surgeon from Kim's Health in Trivandrum. The other panelists are Dr. Anthony from Chennai, Dr. Hitesh Patel from Morbi, Dr. Kazuhiro again, and uh, Dr. Pawan Singhal from Jaipur, Dr. Ramandeep Park from Chandigarh, and Tushar Kanti Ghosh from Kolkata. And I welcome you all to this uh, um, discussion. I think it will be very fruitful because this is a surgery which most of us as ENTs do. And uh, let us get on with the discussion. I request Dr. Vinod Felix to kindly introduce our eminent invited speaker, the keynote speaker. Thank you. So, uh, thank you, sir. It's actually my privilege. It's a, it's a privilege bestowed upon me to introduce our speaker, Dr. Omura. Uh, I just go into his CV. It's a long page, you know. But what I can tell you is that he's a assistant professor at Jikai University in Japan. And skill base is one of the best endoscopic skull base surgeons I've ever seen. You know, he can he can even suture the dura endoscopically. He can does it very meticulously. He's a very fine surgeon. And I would like to uh, ask Dr. Omura to introduce himself. Like he can say like five words because I cannot read the entire thing. It's a very, very long CV. It's a lot of awards. He's a, he, he even has a film made on him. So maybe Dr. Omura, can you introduce yourself in like five words and maybe you can start the lecture thereafter. And the panelists I can introduce after the lecture. That would be apt to introduce the panelists after the lecture because he may, the Omura may leave after the lecture. It's already 9.30 there. So, Professor Kashura Omura, can you please introduce yourself in like five to six words and then start off with the lecture. We are all waiting for you. Yes, thank you very much. So, I, I would like to share my presentations. Can you can you say like five words about yourself, your main achievements? Because you know the your CV is too long. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I had, uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Um, yeah. But uh, during the present, yeah. So I, I, I'm doing the highest number of the skull base cases and the signage malignant cases in Japan, and uh, I invent fifteen new techniques, uh, of in including the ural suturing and also how to remove the crystalline and how to go to the transnasal, uh, transnasal lateral skull base surgery, something like that. So I invent many, many, uh, many, many new techniques. And also I really love to visit Asian country, uh, including India and uh, Cambodia, Myanmar. So that is the first visit uh, in, on, in 2019. It was like a very, I'd say, uh, ex excellent. And it was very fun time uh, to visit uh, Kim's. And I also, I love to, I love to observe the international uh, doctor's operations. I, of course, even in the uh, Japanese operators, but uh, I would like to visit, uh, especially the surgical field. And uh, I would like to observe the operations that is my one of the how to say my my sightseeing it's kind of my sightseeing so i i love to focus on such kind of things so thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, such a great very honored uh, chance to share our uh, operational skills operational methods and let me introduce about the GK University first. Uh, GK University is one of the oldest ENT department. And uh, we have a highest number of the uh, ENT doctors. We have uh, 150 ENT doctors, and including the maybe 30 rhinologists. And uh, 
we also had a very uh, strong contribution uh, for world rhinologic field. And he's a Takahashi. You know, I think that some of you understand the Takahashi forceps. And he's a founder of the Takahashi forceps. His name is Takahashi. And uh, this is our ex ex, -ex uh, professors. And he's Moriyama and he's Otori. And uh, they are giants uh, about the rhinology field in, in the world. And so we found the ECM meeting, uh, 1976. I, I, I don't know, many of you don't understand the ECM meeting, but the, one of the international meeting uh, comes from the start from Japan. And we are the founder. And, uh, and also next year, Next year, we will run the ECM meeting in Japan. And so 2024 and April, the season of the cherry blossom, uh, we will hold the ECM meeting. So if you are interested in uh, to visit Japan and also interested in the uh, worldwide the international uh, operation field, then please uh, come and uh, see us. And uh, this is a number of the cyanide malignant tumor cases in Japan. And uh, this is uh, my cases, and I'm the highest number. And uh, this is a one, one week schedule. And for example, Tuesday, the big, like, uh, uh, yeah, big anterior and the middle skull base surgery. And on Wednesday, uh, we will remove the hard palate uh, together with the assisted uh, endoscopic assisted surgery. And on Friday, the anterior skull base surgery, such kind of things. I do this this kind of the schedule. And uh, almost uh, every day I, I do the uh, tumor and also malignant tumor, including skull base surgery. And I love to, I, I said already, I love to visit uh, Asian country uh, to share my skill. And uh, this year uh, I did the first, we did a first endoscopic skull base surgery in Cambodia. And uh, for the Cambodia, I visited 15, over 15 years. And uh, every year I visit there. And uh, I invite some doctors uh, from them, uh, from, from Cambodia. And they stay, they will stay three months. And fortunately, uh, this year also, two Indian doctors uh, will come uh, to my university to observe our uh, operational skills. I, I love to, I love to, I welcome them. And so because of the over 15 years medical volunteering and also education to the Asian, education to the Cambodian doctors. So I get, I got the medal uh, from the, from the king of the Cambodia. That is also very honored. And uh, at, the, at the last slide of the introduction of the, ourselves, so this is the ECM meeting uh, to, held in 2024. And uh, we had a lot of live surgery, including a real live surgery and also cadaver dissections. And a scientific program also, uh, there are lots of very, very interesting uh, uh, scientific program. And also we uh, are focusing on the hands-on course too. So you can enjoy everything. So please uh, come and visit uh, Japan. Okay, so today, the reason that I don't do the inflammatory disease, I only focus, I, I am only doing the malignant and the tumor cases, but uh, even the, this is the training level of the endoscopic skull base surgery. The step one is always sinus surgery. So sinus surgery is a key, I think. So if you cannot do the sinus surgery very nicely, then you never do the skull base surgery nicely. So I would like to, uh, I think this is a very, very important uh, to know the sinus su surgery. So I would like to share important strategy for ESS. So this is a, this strategy is, comes from GK University uh, and not myself, so GK University. So I, I would like to share the strategy. So the concept of uh, endoscopic sinus surgery, uh, that is uh, so our senior uh, ex-professor uh, start to say the sufficient ventilation and the drainage is uh, important. 
and making wide communication between sinuses. And that is uh, uh, published uh, 1950 in Japanese. And at that time, uh, almost all the, the other doctors, uh, except him, uh, don't believe this kind of concepts. And uh, he was kicked out from the ENT society because uh, this idea is quite like uh, strange. But nowadays, everyone understand, everyone follow the sufficient ventilation and drainage is the most important. And also, ismus surgery causes poor prognosis. Uh, that is also, the, at the time, uh, we never, uh, our, our concept does not believe uh, from other doctors. But nowadays, uh, this is a very basic, uh, basic strategy. And uh, recently, I, we, uh, we also understand that even you will do the bio, uh, but if you do the isthmus surgery, the effectiveness by bio does not, how to say, uh, the effectiveness is not good if you still remain the residual, residual cells. So you have to complete the residual cells. You have to open everything. Then, how to say, even the med medical treatment can be, uh, can be, uh, help, can help uh, to reduce the polyps. But I think that many of you are still scared about the injury of the skull base, injury of the orbit, injury of the middle terminal, something like that. So uh, we also check the complication of the ESS in Japan. And uh, last year also we completed, um, but we still don't publish yet. But uh, basically the complication rate is uh, just uh, below 6%. And uh, almost all the complication is uh, just minor, minor like uh, injury, just temporarily injury, injured about the orbit, like uh, just uh, penetrate uh, periosteum, something like that. And uh, hemorrhage also, just intraoperative hemorrhage is not, not so big uh, hemorrhage, like uh, IC injury, something like that. This is not uh, such kind of things. So it means uh, not many, even you understand this strategy, maybe 20 minutes later, you can understand everything. And then you never face uh, uh, complication of the ESS, uh, severe complications. And for the safe and complete surgery, uh, we have to, of course, we have to check the operation CT scanning, uh, CT planning. And uh, you have to be familiar with the anatomy and the procedures. And at the two, in 2019, I, I shared my skills of how to use the forceps uh, with the, uh, how to use the forceps, but today I don't I don't do such kind of uh, su such kind of uh, presentations. So I only focusing on the how to read the CT planning and also operation operation based on the appropriate strategy for ESS. It means a laminar concept and the area management. I would like to share. And uh, both all of the strategy and hands on uh, we will do we will share at the ECM meeting, 2024. So this is a city city shows. Uh, they, every time we recommend you to check the sagittal view, coronal view, and axial view. But the mainly the coronal view and sagittal view is uh, important. And uh, the, the most important strategy is a third lamina, basal lamina. And once you under identify the basal lamina with the sagittal view, can you see this one? Okay. So this is a sagittal view. Yellow line is a third lamina. So then third lamina, basal lamina attached to the skull base always. Okay. And uh, then you can see the beak, frontal beak here. And then behind the beak, agonized cell. So this patient, the agonized cell is very big. 
And、uh, between the Aga Naji cell and the third lamella, there is a Bura. Second lamella, right? So, Aga Naji cell, Bura, and the third lamella. And this is the Bura is, is modalis, and the、uh, superior part of the Bura is modalis, there is a, super, a suprabural recess here. And、uh, within the suprabural recess,、uh, the AEA, until it's modality running. So, from the coronal view,、uh, there's orbit. And、uh, if you can see the tip of the,、uh, how to say, this, this kind of like a、uh, triangle, this is an、uh, anterior modern artery. So, once you identify the basal lamella, then you can easy to understand、uh, the correlation between anterior、uh, agonage cell, b r i s e m o i d a l i s s u p e r b a r e c e s s And skull base and frontal, frontal sinus. That is a first step, and that is the most, most important. And also, coronary view is a very important, but、uh, mainly, and please focus on how to、uh, detect the、uh, ancinate process. The ancinate process is、uh, very, very important. So once you See, this is a coronal view and、uh, right orbit and left orbit. And this is a maxillary sinus, right? So once you check the slice of the when you understand the、uh, uh, natural ostium、uh, of the maxillary sinus. So here is a natural ostium of the maxillary sinus, right? Then、uh, this is an inf inferior terminate. And at the shoulder of the inferior terminate, there is an ancinate process. Here. So, this is the ancient process, right? And so, once you check this size, then you can go anterior, anterior. You can check the anterior part, okay? So, now still there is an inferior、uh, terminate. And、uh, you can follow these lines. This is the ancient process, the vertical part of the ancient process. Once you go more anterior, 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 okay. Then you can see the a g a n a g e cell here. Okay. a g a n a g e cell is the most anterior cell, anterior sinus, anterior cell、uh, within the sinuses. So this is a g a n a g e cell. So it means、uh, if you follow the、uh, ancient process, then you can identify the a g a n a g e cell. And the ancient process attached to the middle terminate. And also, ancient process attached to the, like, not, not skull base, but attached to here. So that is a, like a septum of the,、uh, I forgot the word,、uh, ISS, intersinus septal cell. Intersinus septal cell, right? Yeah. And also, ancinate process attached to the orbit. So, if you follow the ancinate, then you can identify the、uh, middle turbinate. And also, you can identify the ISSC and you can identify the orbit. So, you always have to、uh, check the, have to follow the ancinate. a n s i n a t e is the most, most important. Then, between the a n s i n a t e the point attached to the orbit, then you can access to the、uh, frontal sinus very easily. So, once you identify the correlation between the frontal sinus and the a n s i n a t e process, then you also can easy to open the、uh, frontal sinus. Okay, so let's go to the lamina concept. So, this is a lamina concept. This is the left nasal cavity. And、uh, this is the ancient process. That is the first lamina. And the second lamina is the b r y s m o i d a l i s And third lamina is the basal lamina. It comes from the middle terminate. Why this is important? Why? Because if you, if you can open The first lamella, 
then you can identify the esmoidal infant bone. Ah, okay. So let's see the uh, sagittal view here. This is a uh, ancient process attached to the like. A, here is a ANC. So that that is the most anterior part of the uh, cell. And uh, Buddha is uh, here. And sometimes Buddha attached to the skull base, but uh, basically that's Buddha attached to the like, uh, like this kind of shape. And third lamina always attached to the skull base. And the fourth lamina is a uh, lamina from the uh, superior terminate. Yeah. And uh, each uh, lamina uh, has uh, its meaning. And once you remove the first lamina, then you can identify the esmoidal infant bloom. What is the esmoidal infant bloom? Esmoidal infant bloom is a line mm. of the orbit. So once you finish the, to remove the ancient process, especially the horizontal part, then you can identify the orbital line. That is very, very important. Then, Buddha is moid. Once you remove the Buddha is moid, then you can see the super, supra Buddha recess. You can see the supra Buddha recess. And also, you can see the anterior face of the third lamella. What is the meaning? Then, after you remove the basal lamella, if you identify the anterior face of the third lamella, then you can identify the skull base. So after remove the first lamella, you can identify the orbit. After remove the second lamella, then you can identify the skull base. That is very important. And once you identify, after remove the second lamella, you you also identify the superior recess. Then you can identify the anterior esmoidal artery. So that is a Three big uh, important landmark, right? Orbit, anterior esmoidal artery, and uh, skull base. That is a three important landmark. But just how to say, first two steps. First, um, if you remove the first lamina and the second lamina, then you can identify everything. But that is a uh, very very important. And we called uh, this is area management. Uh, based on the lamina concept. Okay, so it's more than, this is a it's more than infant bone here. Now, this is a, a axial view. Axial view. Uh, this is the tip of the nose. And once you remove here, once you remove the ancinate, then you can identify the lateral wall of the orbit. Okay, so I would like to share my operational videos. This is a right nasal cavity. And uh, this patient, the CT is here. Uh, CT is, a, uh, I show the CT, the left side, and uh, orbit, and ancient process attached to the orbit. Very, very simple. Very, very simple ancient process. Uh, this is the septum membrane, and uh, this is the right uh, nasal cavity with zero, de zero degree endoscope and a middle terminate here. So now you can identify the attachment of the ancient process. So here is, uh, this is the uh, ancient process. Now you can identify the attachment site of the ancient process here, right? This one here. And the alternate, alternate process is always attached to the shoulder of the inferior turbinate. Now you can see the uh, natural ostium of the maxillary sinus. Then I would like to remove the alternate process here. This is the ancient process. Okay, this is the natural ostium of the maxillary sinus and the blue isomoid and the middle turbinate. Now this is a agonized cell here. 
Okay. So after you remove the unsinate process, you can see the agar nitrate cell here, and also nat natural ostium with the maxillary sinus. And it, here, this is a esmoidal infant bone. So it means uh, orbital lines, lateral orbital line. Okay. Then uh, that's uh, again, uh, this is a sagittal view of the CT scan. And uh, if you follow the third lamella, then you can identify the superbar recess here. And uh, within the superbar recess, there is a anterior ismoidal artery. Uh, almost 97% of the cases, you can see the uh, you can see the anterior ismoidal artery within within the superbar recess. So after I remove the bulla, this is a left nasal cavity and zero degree endoscopic view. And after I remove the bulla ismoid, then ismoidal lymphodema here. So it means that this is a line of the orbit, and this is a superbar recess, and this is the anterior face of the third lamella, basal lamella. Okay, this is the anterior face of the third lamella, and this is a, a lamella papyracea, and uh, here is the anterior ismoidal artery. And here is a superbar recess. So you can uh, identify almost everything. Okay, so this is a right side nasal cavity again. So this is a right side orbit. And this is a bulla. Bulla attached to the orbit. And uh, here is a middle terminate. And uh, you can see the uh, natural ostium to the uh, maxillary sinus. So now you can identify that here is the orbit, right? And I just want to remove the Buddha. So Buddha attached to the orbit. So you be careful not to remove, not to damage the lamina papyracea. And now you can see that this is the anterior smoother artery, right? Yeah. So after remove the Buddha smoid, still you can follow the orbital lines. And uh Now you can see the anterior artery here and the skull base line and the frontal sinus and the maxilla sinus here. So then you can identify the anterior face of the basal lamella here. Okay, this is the anterior face of the basal lamella after removing the, uh, after opening the maxilla sinus more widely. So how to detect the third lamella? That, that is, uh, comes from the bottom of the middle terminate. So this is a, a middle terminate and also basal lamella and attached to the skull base. Then you open up the middle terminate, uh, third lamella, and uh, I will I will remove the anterior face of the uh, third lamella. Okay, so then, now you can open up the front, uh, posterior esmoid. So behind the middle terminate, then you can see the fourth lamina here. This is a superior terminate, right? So at the last, this is the fourth lamina. So how to open the fourth lamina? Same. The, if, now you can identify the fourth lamina, and you can identify the medial edge of the fourth lamina. 
So this and uh, this is a uh, middle. Uh, this is a uh, uh, orbital line, lamina papyracea. And uh, this case is the very small uh, onodi cell here. And also this is a spheroid sinus. So I would like to open the both. This is a superterminate. And it always medially inferior, medially inferior of the uh, lamina. That is a very safe area. I just open up here. That is the false lamina. So this is the only cell. So you can see the optic nerve very nicely. And this is only so I have to I have to open up the sphenoid too. So here is just sphenoid sinus. Okay. So oh, this is a take home message. I just share the Esmoid infantibulum, the superbar recess is a key landmark during surgery and area management based on the lamina concept is a uh, very help to complete the ESS safely. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Omura. It's a lovely presentation. Uh, maybe I can just uh, ask you some questions if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, I just noted that you are using only two instruments, like a flag knife that you use for ear surgery and a true cut forceps. You are not using any micro debrader or shavers, but why mm. is that so? Yeah, there is a, if, uh, I, well, of course, I, I have a micro debrider, and uh, sometimes I use a micro debrider only for the like a polypoid regions. Mm -hmm. There's a many massive polyps. Then I use a micro debrider together with the forceps. And uh, I just, I did recently, uh, even in Japan, Japanese ENT doctors, uh, for ENT doctors, and some doctors use a micro debrider just like a forceps, like, like yeah. a crash and debride, debride, debridement. Mm -hmm. So we used to do such kind of things, crash and uh, like a debridement just with one micro debrider. But uh, I don't like this because uh, it is not beautiful. Okay. And it is not safe. So I only, so micro, I love micro debrider, but uh, micro debrider should be used only for the soft tissue. Okay. I don't want to crush with uh, micro debrider. Crushing and uh, like a uh, hard, hard things, bone, and the lamina should mm -hmm. be crushed by forceps. Okay. So that is a, uh, how to say, my strategy. So you're just keeping the instruments minimal, like one or two instruments and doing the surgery very beautifully, right? <laughs> okay. Yes, yes. Actually, I think if you can, can come to GK University, we mm -hmm. invent all of the instruments. So we have uh, maybe over 200, 100, 200 forceps. And okay. uh, even uh, just one one case, at least we have to use uh, uh, 30, 30 kinds of the forceps, but I don't like this. Th this is my previous doctors use uh, okay. this one, but this is uh, too complicated. Okay, so I okay. try to simplify mm -hmm. the uh, sur surgeon, surgery. So I, I always, how to say, use only few forceps and uh, also first step, goal, for second step, uh, upward forceps, third step, straight forceps, always the same. And if you do ESS, then you can, you can do. Okay, okay. So that's a lovely presentation, Professor Omura. Uh, will you be staying back for the panel or... Uh... Is it possible for you to stay back for the panel? Okay. Of course. So whenever you find sleepy or tired, probably <laughs> if we leave, I can understand it's already 10 o'clock there. 
no no and, no okay right so thank you once again and maybe uh, we can go for the panel discussion straight away so i think you like to i let this share my screen first and then introduce the speakers Uh, so before I start with the panel, maybe I would like uh, to introduce all the speakers. And uh, again, no, I don't want to take much time. Maybe I can ask uh, all the elegant speakers to introduce themselves by giving like two or three words about themselves. So uh, let me start with uh, Anthony, sir. Anthony, sir, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Sir, I, I know you are the professor of ENT. I know everything about you, but then... For the sake of the panel, can you just introduce yourself in three words? Yeah, I am a professor in uh, Madras Medical College. We have been doing uh, endoscopic sinus surgeries from 2000-2001 uh, uh, time. So, uh, uh, we really have started. Uh, before the two years, I was in uh, forensic medicine. I was doing cavity dissections. Uh, because when I did my post graduation, there were no endoscopes in MMC. So, two years I took myself doing cannabis and then started doing this. And uh, uh, one of my interests is skull based surgery, while the other interest is in endoscopic ear surgery that all of us do. Uh, um, that's it. So, uh, thank you, Anthony, sir. And of course, I should tell that he's my teacher. He taught me all the basics and of course, even advanced surgeries. He taught me a lot of things in my uh, PG course. So uh, let us now go to Ramandeep, sir. Ramandeep, sir, can you introduce yourself? Uh, good evening, everyone. I am uh, Ramandeep uh, Virk. I am a professor at the PGI uh, MER at Chandigarh. And uh, my main focus of work is uh, interior skull base, endoscopic endonasal interior skull base surgery. And uh, that's, uh, uh, you know, where uh, uh, my uh, love uh, for the surgery lies. Uh, I, I should say, the Ramandeep sir has a lot of many great students like, you know, the, the students in SGPG, they always say that we learned everything from Ramandeep sir. I met those surgeons that remember that uh, SGPG guys, they're too good. And they always Thank say you. everything is from Ramandeep sir. So he's a great surgeon, a great teacher. So maybe... Pavan Singhal, Dr. Pavan Singhal, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Dr. Pavan Singhal. I'm senior professor in unit head with Department of ENT and Adnex Surgery at SMS Medical College, Jaipur. My areas of interest are anterior lateral skull base, adnex, and co cochlear implants. So uh, I know uh, we know this is going to do a good job. Let's hope for the best. So, uh... Thank you, Pavanji. Pavan is like a jack of all arts. He does everything in ENT. You know, laryngectomy, ear, cochlea, that, everything. He's a, he's a jack of all arts in ENT. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Pavanji. And maybe uh, let us go to Tushar, sir. Sir, are you there? Yes. I know you're having a uh, cadaver dissection going on. Yes, in yes, hospital. <laughs> yeah. yes. I'm Dr. Tushar Gandhi Ghosh from Kolkata. I'm the director and founder director of the Ghosh ENT Foundation. It's a dedicated ENT hospital. 23 bed, 4 OT, and uh, have uh, all instrument, including uh, luminous laser, navigation system, NAR monitor, every advanced instrument. Thank so, you. Uh, thank you, Tushar, sir, for being here in spite of all your, your busy schedule. Uh, I know you conduct a lot of workshops. I think you have con you conduct one workshop every month, probably. <laughs> so, uh, now, Dr. Hitesh. Hitesh is other jack of all arts in ED. He does everything, you know. He does even the Endoscopic yeah. MVD. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Hitesh, can you introduce yourself? Uh, I am Dr. Hitesh Patel uh, from Morbi, Gujarat. Uh, I have private practice since uh, 2007. Okay. So I think you do all your work in your private practice. Yes, yes, sir. I am yes. private practice only. So it's my you know, privilege and uh, to have all of you. The audience, you. Is, well, the audience are really lucky to have all of you here. And maybe with that, we can just jump on to the panel discussion. So it's on uh, difficult scenarios. And I would like 
not to have a panel like in the left corner image and very hot panel discussion or a very heated argument. Maybe we can have something, a fruitful panel discussion. So, and uh, since the time is limited, my talk is focused only on inflammatory pathologies or sinusitis surgery. I don't want to jump to non-inflammatory pathologies and tumors because that's too elaborate and we cannot complete that in this limited time. And uh, coming to the difficult scenarios, I always feel that we should classify it like that, the pre-op, in-op, and post-op. And, and one of the most difficult scenarios is your pre-op challenge. So is there some background noise somewhere? Okay, so okay, so one of the most challenging things is the pre-op decision making. So let me start with probably Anthony, sir. What is your most difficult pre-op challenge in endoscopic uh -huh. sinus surgery? For the pre-op challenges, uh, recurrent surgeries. First thing is recurrent surgery because uh, the amount of endoscopic sinus surgery is done for a CRS nowadays is coming lower and lower with the, all the uh, knowledge about the um, uh, maximal medical therapies and, uh, and the medical management and the load of steroids and the steroid impregnated uh, nasal washes. So uh, once you, you are decided to operate on a patient, the patient has got a polyps. For a patient who has got a recurrent uh, disease with the uh, osteitis, it's very difficult for uh, that's the most challenging situation for the surgeons. Okay, this is a, this is a lovely statement. I think I would be coming to that. Uh, is there any difference in opinion, uh, Ramandeep sir? Is it the same or something different for you? Uh, more or less the same. Uh, and uh, another uh, scenario which is difficult for me is uh, pediatric age group. Because okay. you know the compliance uh, is not going to be the same as an adult. There are going to be no nasal douching, nasal washes. Kids are very, very difficult. I mean, some kids are, uh, are very compliant, but majority of them uh, are not. And then uh, many of them would have associated cystic fibrosis. So that that is a nightmare, um, uh, you know, to treat uh, those patients. Mm -hmm. So how often do you see the cystic fibrosis patients? So uh, as protocol, any pediatric patient coming to us will be sent to uh, our advanced pediatric center where they are worked up for cystic fibrosis. And we do get a decent number uh, of cases. Then your surgical plan changes, your the kind of surgery you do change, uh, you know, it changes because you want to expose as much as possible uh, to be, uh, you know, able to uh, mm -hmm. do a better uh, surgery and reduce recurrence. But no matter what you do, it's a child post-op uh, examination also is very, very difficult, let like, alone trying to suction out the secretions uh, in a um, uh, you know, seven or eight year old. Uh, Follow-up is very difficult. So uh, that forms a nightmare. With adults, uh, you know, uh, it's okay uh, because uh, adults can be compliant or non-compliant. The non-compliant ones will come back with, uh, you know, uh, recurrent uh, disease. That's right. But the compliant ones who understand that nasal washes are uh, very important. And the surgery is not the curative. It is actually the medical management. And the surgery is just done to open the sinuses wide. So that steroid douches, as Dr. Anthony said, can be, uh, you know, uh, uh, can go up to the sinuses. Another mm -hmm. subgroup I worry about is the ones who have preoperatively not responded to steroids. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's a lovely statement. Maybe uh, Tushar, sir, Dr. Pavan, any difference? Uh, this, uh, these three, uh, one just point, uh, in yeah. case of children, Mm -hmm. Pediatric age group, I have seen a lot of uh, patients coming to us uh, with CT scan, basically chronic rhinosinusitis, and patients also, party ah, also, okay. uh, uh, doing interested to do the sinus surgery. But I have seen a lot of patients with huge adenoid, nasal obstruction. If you do adenoid uh, correctly and uh, nasal was correct and nasal spray, internasal corticosteroid, and nasal spray also, moment zone. And definitely patients improve, but patients party also anxious about the chronic sinusitis because they have done the CT scan and shown the uh, lots of uh, secretion in the um, sinus cavity. That is mm -hmm. the, I think in my experience, and, uh, yeah, that is not required the uh, sinus surgery in case of children. And also with uh, pressure of the party, I have uh, opened some sinus cavity. I have seen nothing. Okay. So good antibiotic, good uh, in the nasal wash. And if you do the proper uh, nasal obstruction correction, means adenoid surgery, and then uh, patients will be absolutely fine. That is also a pre-op challenge in case uh, of... Uh, uh, 
I think even even most guidelines like the EPOS guidelines also say the same. They did. So I did not take me first and only then first on the second sitting, right? But we know many surgeons in the West will also do a balloon uh, cyanoplasty. They will okay. uh, widen the maxillary antrum, give it a nice uh -huh. wash, and uh, get and done it over with. Okay, for the pediatric patients, sir. For the pediatric patients, yes. Once okay. they are doing an adenoidectomy, they do balloon. I mean, they don't do the uh, uh, full house routine, face routine okay. procedure. Just a balloon cyanoplasty because maxillary sinus. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, just widen it, give it a nice wash. And, okay. Uh, that's a good idea but then in india it's now you know it's very difficult no, uh, we idea. don't do it i am um, i'm just even i haven't done it this is what i'm quoting from the american academy uh, you know we saw a few lectures on uh, okay so the problem with the pediatric uh, uh, patients are uh, the surgery is uh, uh, canvassing surgery is easier but how are you going to give the post operative care oh that's exactly. that's a problem it's a real problem sit, so, sit in the, in the clinic and uh, once their turn comes, they will, they will start crying, 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 crying. Bring them, do whatever you want to do, and then bring them out uh, under low, under uh, anesthesia or not. Once they, they go out, they will be very happy. So, yeah, and then uh, it's very difficult for them to convince. Professor you know, Omura, uh, uh, you have something on, to say on that, Dr. Omura? Professor Omura, are you there? Professor Omura? Okay. Uh, and another, uh, just one point. Yeah, yeah. Point. Another preoperative challenge. I feel yeah, sure. lots of point is there. I feel if you uh, uh, convince the patients, uh, take the some course of anti uh, antibiotic and course of steroid and nasal spray. After that, patient thinks uh, does not require the surgery. Also, this is also preoperative challenge <laughs> okay. because the, yes. after that um, good medicine, <laughs> after that you are want to do surgery, then patient okay. does not want. But in the acute case, patients want to do surgery. That is also pre-operative challenge for me. Uh, if you see a patient with the uh, opaque maxillary sinus, and you take up the patient for surgery within two three weeks, and if you open up, nothing will be there. Okay, that's true. Hitesh, Doctor Hitesh, anything? Uh, any, anything most of the, sir, most of the physicians uh, do CT scan during active phase, so mm -hmm. it is very difficult to explain the patient uh, about the disease. Okay. So always do CT scan after a course of uh, antibiotic and steroid. Really? Okay. <clears throat> okay. One more point because I wanted to make. It is uh, the patients who are elderly patients who are there on aspirin or some blood thinning agents and they do have severe hypertension and that is not getting okay. So that is a nightmare to me. Like <laughs> okay. those patients, how I'm going to deal intraoperatively. It is a big problem because you have to start back on aspirin immediately after surgery somehow. So these are some patients and AFRS is one of the uh, one nightmare for me. Like okay. preoperative, it is a challenge always because patient, most of the patient will get some disease later on again and again. Mm -hmm. So AFRS is something which I have to tell them that you have to come back to me within three months or maybe every six months to get it clear again a bit of. Maybe that's why I have the next, the next question actually. You know, yeah. the biggest challenge for me is the patient will come like that. Sir, everybody says he'll recur. There is no use in doing yeah. a surgery. So how do you how do you canvas these sort of patients? I think uh, <laughs> in my books, it is the quality of life, I tell them. Hmm. And when the facilities are available there, we can remove the disease and maybe no remission. But still, you are going to get a good quality of life. First thing hmm. is that. Second thing, somehow you have to tell the patients the complications. If they don't, if you don't get it done, it might spread to orbit or maybe uh, it, it can erode the bones or something like that. So you have to tell them the sickly of not operating or leaving the disease behind and the quality of life issue. That is something I tell them. Because you know, all the, there are the studies in the Google which says like after 12 to 13 years, most polyps will recur. It's even like you know, there's 98 percent of polyps can recur if the counts are like this, no. So they refer all these Google sort of things. And then they come to you. Sir, it's like that. Seen, you Google, even Google says like that. <laughs> so <laughs> what do you say? Tushar, sir, anything from you? Yeah, uh, that is very uh, correct. I, I counsel the patient uh, three ways. Uh, I do I will do good surgery. So the recurrence depends on the uh, surgery and follow-up also. If I do the good surgery and uh, medicine will work, so I facilitate the medical disease basically, and I will do the surgery uh, to reduce your uh, symptom. 
and then follow up also essential some patients come uh, coming after one month okay fine after then then uh, stop after okay. three years again coming and then this volume change is there so this is not possible so if i do good surgery and if uh, you are responsible you not uh, good follow up so both way both way win win situation if you are interested to maintain, uh, definitely we will do surgery. Definitely there is a chance of recurrence. But if uh, I extend the recurrence after 20 years, 10 years, 12, that is the benefit. Quality of life will be improved at the time. So surgery required at any cost. Okay. So, uh, Professor Omur, are you there? You left? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, so, Professor Omur, any comments from your side? Hmm. Because see, the patient says that it's going to recur. Even the Google says it recurs. So why is surgery required? Yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. it's, so, yes. Yeah, nasal, po mm. recurrent nasal poly. Is, uh, 90, mm, our, our recurrent ratio is uh, basically 70%. 70%? I don't know, and, uh, 30% of the patient are recurred. Okay. Yeah. After and, yeah, for yes. for that cases, I just we we just uh, recently we just uh, show the the operation or bio the okay like like a medic medications mm -hmm. or something like that and so recently the how to say the ratio how to say recur re surgery the ratio of the re surgery is uh, quite become lower and lower okay. So, uh, Anthony, sir? Yeah, actually, when I started doing uh, sinus surgeries, it was only septoplasty and the uh, antral wash and the intranasal antral tennis. So, then once I started getting endoscope and started doing phase, we max, we do uh, movement and trust me and the, and the part of an antiretinal thing. Do this when the patient comes and talks like this, we will then no, 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 that is uh, different antral wash or uh, things like that. This is, but now the 20 years made sex is the, the same uh, failure rate. So, important thing is I don't give them high hopes, first thing. Okay. So, uh, we tell them we can, you have a to catch infection often and it uh, does very soon like other people so you operated you also will, will become like anybody else still you can catch infection but uh, it will become uh, it can be treated easily that's the only idea of surgery so okay. more than this again, you will have so uh Raman, you say anything different from you it's the same uh, it's the same and, uh, you know, it also depends on the kind of practices we work in. Uh, this question, um, uh, you know, for us, uh, where uh, the waiting times are horrendous and uh, patients usually uh, don't tend to ask uh, too many questions. Yes, they do, do come up with whatever tree occurs again. And you just have to nicely, uh, you know, just explain to them, yes, yes, this disease is known to reoccur, but if you keep on regular follow-up, we might give you a few cycles of steroids over the next few years or steroidal douches or uh, intranasal steroids, and we can suppress the disease. We cannot eradicate the disease. Things and are different. Them, uh, things do are understand. Different. It's how you communicate with you know, things are different for people like me and uh, Tushar sir, Hitesh who are working in. Uh, yes, actually, <laughs> Tushar, sir, uh, Tushar sir made a very valid point because this has come up in many times that you give the patient pre op steroids, he doesn't come back. Okay. Okay. Because they feel the disease is opened up and then they start abusing steroids. Whenever there's obstruction, they take steroids. And so, do you. Uh, no, something, something is going on to be an editing. Dr. Omur, I think your mic is okay. Yeah, there's some background volume from yours. Not my my Gotham, Gotham, Gotham's Gotham mic, I think. So, Gotham, sir, can you mute your mic, sir, please? So, um, so what about this? All these phenotypes that. No, 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 so, do you follow all these phenotypes, endotypes? Are they important in your practice? Do you really follow this or do, you do some particular workup for all those things? The phenotype, endotypes, are they important? Do you classify? Do you do some pre-op investigations in your practice? You're ask, you, you asking me? Yeah, I'm asking oh, you. Oh, okay. Uh, 
No, uh, how to say? Basic, basically, no. No, you don't. Okay. Yeah. So, what about uh, Anthony, sir? So, the phenotypes and endotypes, do you classify think, this? Uh, with the toilet, we we'll think of surgery early. I mean, in the sense you see the patient with the toilets, uh, one of the main line of treatment will become surgery. But with the toilet, we, we, unless the patient goes for a complication or a retractile twin treatment and uh, you give a, a maximal medical therapy, then take CT scan. In spite of that, you see uh, the areas of obstruction in an osteometrical complex or in the mucosillary pathway. Only those patients uh, with a uh, proper guard uh, uh, information will think of surgery. But all of patients, uh, they they might require surgery at uh, at any time, and the chances are then to recur recurrence also is high. But to, to deliver uh, steroids and uh, other washes to the to, to the sinuses, you got to do surgery for these patients. Okay, Ramandeep sir, is the same or in different opinion? Uh, well, of course, if there's a thesis going on, then uh, yes, uh, all this is followed uh, for uh, routine um, endoscopic sinus work. Um, uh, we don't follow, okay, because it is not the uh, it is not the end all for uh, everything. There is a lot of uh, if you uh, read the practol uh, by the European, uh, you know, Academy, you'll uh, see the strengths and weaknesses of all uh, this classification. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, we take polyp biopsy and uh, uh, look for the uh, eosinophil infiltration. This doesn't have a big role in the preoperative uh, assessment of surgery, but uh, post-operative steroids and post-operative management this is very, very, uh, very, very useful. Particularly the eosinophilic type, uh, we'll have a, uh, definitely have a tendency to to recur back. So, uh, Tushar, sir, uh, Hite, Dr. Hitesh, any, Pavan, Dr. Pavan, anything from your side? Same or? No, There's some same. difference? No, same, same, same. Sir. Okay, now let us yes, jump to the surgical part now, right? The surgery is more important. So, uh, let's go sinus by sinus. So, the maxillary sinus, here comes a very common question. How wide do you open the maxillary sinus in chronic sinusitis? You just do you just remove the ancinate process or you widen it? Uh, if, if you widen, how do you do, how do you widen? Do you widen anterior, posterior, superior, inferior? So, what is your protocol like? Let me start from probably uh, Dr. Pavan. Yeah. So you know, if it is uh, nasal polyposis or just chronic sinusitis without nasal polyposis, mm -hmm. I'll remove the ancinate process and that's it. Uh, just suction the things inside and job done. But if it is AFRS, if it is allergic fungal rhinosinusitis, I'll I'll need to have a wider opening because uh, the role of post of douching is more than my surgery in AFRS yeah. and and the CRS with polyposis. So in that case, I have to widen it a bit more. What where do I widen it? I widen it inferiorly a bit. Really, I don't come ahead because NLD is there. You can injure that. Superior, you don't go because your lamina is coming down there and orbit is there. So, partially, you can do a bit with the true cutting forceps, entry true cutting forceps. And, but you have to be uh, careful uh, for the anterior branch of the spinoplatinal artery, which bleeds afterwards in a few patients I've seen. They come ah, up. Ah, the posterior period. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yes, yes, yes. So that is an important thing. So you have to buzz that off and then do this. So this is how I follow. AFRS, maximum widening. Uh, uh, CRS with nasal polyposis, medium. Mm -hmm. If it is CRS, no uh, extra widening, only ancillary process uh, removal and job done. Okay, so that's lovely. Tusha, sir? Basically, according to pathology, <clears throat> if uh, too much pathology is there, uh, maximum widening is required, basically. If pathology is less, uh, you may open the maxillary opening will be less. The same like Not what Dr. Pavan told, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. So, Dr. Hitesh? Uh, same, sir. Same, same. Type one, type 1 in case of polyposis. <laughs> type 2 in case of fungal sinusitis is very wide opening. And okay. type three and four for tumor so, approach. So what, what do you mean like by saying type one, type two, type yes, three? Sir, type uh, sir, type one means uh, we have to wide the uh, antrum uh, superiorly up to the inferior level of orbit, inferiorly up to the uh, 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 inferior turbine, anteriorly up to NLD. Okay. 
okay routine routine case is type 1 okay it type 2 up to the wide huge opening up to the posterior uh, wall of maxillary sinus like okay. dr uh, pawan sir said okay and type okay. 3 means uh, removal of uh, posterior uh, half of the inferior turbinate also mm -hmm. okay and type 4 is our classical uh, uh, medial maxillectomy okay Modified so, dankers. Modified dankers, yeah. So I think you have some video on the NLT damage during, uh, right? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So maybe towards the end we can play that. It's a, okay, sir. Okay. Right? So uh, what about uh, uh, the the tips, sir? The, for a chronic size, that is, size of the uh, uh, middle matter and the semi will be depend, depending upon whether there's an accessory osteum or not. Uh, I'll come to that, sir. That's a lovely thing. And there is no big pathology inside that everything looks fine. We don't do anything. And other important thing is we don't remove all around. If you remove all around, it becomes smaller. And second thing is you make a huge osteum doesn't prevent the patient not having uh, uh, sinusitis. But uh, it is very useful for uh, dousing purposes. But uh, because the, all the lymphatics go around the osteum, when you do all these options, there is a lymphatic stages and still infection can be there. Okay. So uh, maybe before I come to that, I, uh, before I come to Ramandeep, sorry, may I play this video? See, uh, this is what I generally do for recurrent cases. It's called uh, nasalization. This right side, so that's the right middle turbinate. And here we are, we just chop off this part of the inferior turbinate. We take a mucosal flap from the inferior turbinate. We chop the inferior turbinate like that, make two cuts there. And I, with the color out, I take a mucosal flap. I base it inferiorly like that. Take the flap down and then I drill off all this bone so that I get a, so that's now the nasal cavity and the maxilla is in line. They are on the same level. And then I put the mucosal flap back. So this is what actually uh, some Type people two. do for uh, recurrent cases. Are uh, you called type 3? I don't know. Yes. So this is what I call nasalization of maxillary sinus. Uh, so I think, and in your view, this is not, this has its own demerits, right? Sorry? So it has its own demerits when I widen it like that. That's what you're saying. The That's right. Yeah. In fact, even if you do a wide middle from the uh, anterior border to the posterior wall, from the uh, 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 orbit to the level of the almost attachment of the uh, inferior turbinate, uh, there is some amount of stages will be there. The mucociliary the clearance will not be as good as doing uh, minimal uh, damage to the maxillary sinus osteum for a simple sinus osteum. Simple sinus. So in a recurrent cases, you can do like this. Yes, we got to uh, do this. That is, make it wider. Uh, so that uh, if it comes... Uh, so, uh, Ramandeep, sir. Sorry, sorry. Sir, you may continue. You may continue. Please, sir. Yeah. And, sir, you, are, you can continue. I think you are so saying something. The management entirely depends upon the uh, uh, sterile spray and the, and the washes. For that, you got to make it a huge multimetal antrasomy that you will go. Okay. So, uh, Ramandeep, sir, is the same or something different from you on your side? Uh, so, um, uh, if you ask me, there is no one correct answer for the size of uh, okay. anterostomy. Uh, it's uh, uh, agreed, uh, you know, it's completely your practice. When you're beginning out as a new surgeon, um, you know, opening up wider might help you to clear the disease. Like Pavan was saying, AFRS. Now, AFRS has an inherent habit of going deep into the maxillary antrum. And to remove it or to flush it out, it takes some amount of large opening of the maxillary antrostomy. And like Hitesh was saying, the type 1, type 2, they are uh, that's a, also a classification system. And type 1 is 1 centimeter, type 2 is 2 centimeter. But for, uh, and if you're doing a transterigoid approach or tumor approaches, of course, you have to open wide. The posterior end has to be taken up to the, you know, posterior end of the maxilla. So that is <clears throat> also, uh, that's a very uh, different scenario. But there's a very interesting article by Brahman uh, et al. in which they studied, uh, uh, you know, xenon gas uh, sheep models. And they said that in ventilation, if it's a normal disease, an opening a sinus two to four millimeter or, and they compared a six to nine millimeter opening, there is not much difference in uh, ventilation. So the type of disease you are, uh, uh, you know, are dealing with uh, surgical expertise, and of course, uh, what approach uh, you are you are trying to uh, you know get? Uh, it's going to decide uh, the kind of uh, and yeah. you're going to do. So uh, maybe this slide. Uh, 
professor omura can you comment on this ct scan how what's how you approach them any precautions you take uh in the maxillary sinus surgery in this patient professor omura yeah uh, your uh, comments on the ct scan yeah so there's a very very small maxillary sinus and uh mm -hmm. the, how to say the flow of the maxillary sinus is elevated to the okay. middle uh, if you compare to the left side, the middle of of the how to say uh, middle of the so, height. So it's a hypoplastic maxillary sinus, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So how do you do the ansonectomy in this patient? The same technique or something different? I think you yeah, do. You especially the how to say vertical part, vertical part of the ansonate process, and that mm -hmm. that is also the how to say this is a high uh, to at at a the maxillary, maxillary sinus on the atelectactic antenate process. That is a very, okay. very dangerous, uh, dangerous uh, case of the like uh, dangerous cases. So you have, mm -hmm. you should not, re how to say, insert the knife uh, to the orbit. Yeah, orbit. Yeah. Because see, and I can see the small. Cases, I think the, you can, you can access it through, through the inf inferior. Uh, inferior meters too, like that. Yeah, yeah. Meter. Okay, that's a that's a good idea. So, um, Ramandeep yeah. sir, your comments. I think there can be a, there is a small cell also there. Hello, yeah. sir. Hello, sir. So yeah, so so this is the case. Majority of us, if we are not careful, will end up in the orbit. Mm -hmm. Yes. So your precautions. How do you maybe Pavan? How do you direction of the instrument? It has okay. to be inferiorly trim part of the upper part of the inferior turbinate and you will get an easy entrance. You mean and your trim here? I'll, I'll right. prefer Correct. the backbiting here. I'll prefer the backbiting for sets over here. Okay. Rather okay. than the, the, um, maybe a free years or whatever you want to take the anterior, which I'll come from back. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take a ball probe to elevate the incident a bit. Okay. Uh, create some space and then mm -hmm. use a backbiting. Okay. But thing is, sometimes you just enter the cells and cell in your country. So yeah. it's a maxillary yeah. sinus or the. Yeah. Okay. So you do the retrograde technique and not the anterograde technique. Is that yes. what you're saying? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Anthony, sir, any comments from your side? This is actually a type 3 hypoplastic maxilla. So what is type 1, type 2? Type when there's a uh, ancillary process will be at the level of the, uh, um, the lamina papricia. Okay. Type 2 will be lateral to the, the laminate apresia while you have a, a appreciable amount of sinus. Type 3, you will have a small slit. On top of the ear, you have a, something like a, 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 a hala cell there. Yeah, 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 right, right. This one. Okay. So that makes it very small. So what you do is the the gap between the floor of the the orbit and the yeah, audio. will not be same anteriorly as well as posteriorly. So try to make a artificial millimeter antrostomy posteriorly and to find uh, superior border of the inferior turnip, start uh, backbiting from there. Uh, then you can find the natural ostium at that uh, uh, space without entering into the orbit. Okay, okay. That will be my technique. So, uh, Dr. Hitesh, anything uh, from sir, you? 70 degree, uh, sir, 70 degree. Sir, I would like to use only 70 degree in, uh, uh, endoscope this in this case. Yeah, not 30 mm -hmm. degree also, sir. Okay. Okay, okay. that's a good technique. Uh, Tushar, sir? Yeah, Same? if you careful and definitely uh, no no injury will be there to the orbit. And just angle endoscope is the best way this uh, for this case. Okay. If you take the angle endoscope, then easily you will get uh, the entry. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if you are not sure, then uh, you just trim the turbinate part. Okay. Then it will be easy, easy entry. Maybe uh, as what as Professor Mura said, you can go through the inferior also if you are so confused, right? Yeah. So, uh, how often do you see a circular phenomenon and a mistostial sequence, uh, Doctor Hitesh? Do you commonly see? A, uh, how frequent no, is sir. it? No, not much. No, no, sir, uh, not commonly seen. Sir. Not commonly. And uh, Ramandeep sir, is it important the circular phenomenon? Is it very common or uncommon? Um, we do see it and uh, mostly uh, even post-surgical, uh, post-surgery also sometimes it happens. You've opened the maxillary antrum, but a fibrous band forms in the middle so that there or that the openings become two instead of a single one. I mean, just take them to the minor OT with a through cut, just snip uh, that. Cut it. Should it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah. And even okay. even the accessory ostia, if the previous surgeon has not addressed the accessory ostia, he has not make uh, made a common opening of accessory and the primary os. Then okay. it, and sometimes with the inferior medial androstomy also it okay. happens. Okay. Uh, so uh, <laughs> see, this is actually I am doing a middle medial androstomy, but then. Uh, See, with the zero degree endoscope, I cannot see the accessory host in this one. I cannot see the accessory host. Only, with, only once I change to 30 degree, I can see the accessory host. So do you routinely use uh, angled endoscope when you do the maxillary sinus surgery? Yes. yes. For, for maxillary and the frontal sinus, I always use the angled endoscope. Um, there is because there is a classical technique process, Stamberg was one, you have to switch over to the 30 degree endoscope once you open the maxillary sinus. But nowadays, people just use a zero degree. And I see that sometimes even I miss the accessory host because yes. that happens. So, uh, Ramandeep, sir, your comments? Another common thing is uh, people make uh, one ostium and uh, miss the natural ostium. That is more common than missing the accessory ostium. And uh, we should always keep in our mind that Stamberger's criteria for the, the natural ostium, like it is not circular, it is oval, and it's facing uh, not directly facing the, the millimeters. All these things should be in your, in your mind when you are doing a millimeter antrostomy because we can indirectly make an opening, then uh, uh, going uh, uh, getting the actual natural ostium. Okay. So, uh, Ramandeep, sir, your comments? I think we can move ahead. Um, yeah. So, the next thing, probably, the how to remove the fungus. We use, see, this is a allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. So, the fungus trapped in this alveolar recess and zygomatic recess. It's always a challenge for all of us, right? So, uh, how do you remove the fungus from these corners? So, Ramandeep, sir, so once you, even if you open so, the see, this, is, body, this is exactly what we were talking about in uh, the previous slides that the deep depth and you have a, a fungal ball. Mm -hmm. Many of times we try to uh, suction it, don't try to suction it. Your suctions are going to get clogged. You're going to be opening the suction up, putting it in repeatedly, repeatedly, and it's going to test your patients. Easiest way is uh, with a, uh, you know, angled suction, just dislodges a bit and then just let it go with hundreds and hundreds ml of saline. All this is going to come out. Uh, Metronic also makes what's called a hydro debrider, which is a high pressure, uh, you know, uh, ventilation jet uh, of uh, saline, which can help uh, pushing these uh, away. But again, that's expensive and that's nothing extra what a 50 ml or a large uh, syringe uh, with an angled suction attached to it cannot do. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Hitesh. Uh, uh, sir, I, I always use a uh, half piece of merosin, sir. Uh, half piece of merosil and cowed suction and uh, press the merosil with uh, cowed suction and okay. uh, then give the saline post. Repeatedly, we have to do this. Okay. You have to take a big merosil. Sorry, okay. sorry, sorry. You have to okay. take, uh, take a big merosil, no small. No merosil. So, but I generally use this you know, ghost technique. I just take the ghost. Yes, yes. I also. The, okay. You so put the ghost. Yes, sir. I also use put the ghost. Put the ghost. Put the ghost. Automatically, all fungus, fungal uh, will be uh, automatically removed. I, I push it in the, 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 the maxillary sinus. Fold it, fold it, fold it, push it inside. And then, okay. then hold with the forceps and do this screen like movements all around. Like that, you see? Is and it then the same? Push. Okay. Yes. The way you are doing, yeah. Okay, okay. This is the second video. It's a previous so, yeah, yeah. Okay. So Please. use the ghost more often than the mirosil, right? Yes. So uh you also so uh, I think already Remdis are told, told about the irrigations. Yes. So generally we just use the 50 cc syringe and we don't have the the metronics uh, now comes with a hydro irrigation, right? Hydro debride, correct. Okay, but then this even 50 cc is also good enough. Oh, that yes, enough. It works, it works well. Works well, right? Do you use any peroxide, dilute hydrogen peroxide with uh, um, uh, beta dilute and the uh, water in uh, my dilutions and put inside, which will dislodge the uh, fungal balls and can easily take it out. That's that's also a good technique. You can use some uh, hydrogen peroxide or maybe some the soap solution. Or the baby shampoo. Baby this, shampoo. this can uh, this can dislodge the fungus. 
And in spite of that, if you don't, uh, you can't reach a value in a recess, you can still do a, a quick uh, pre-lacrimal approach, make a window and you can, you can push this inside and take it out. Okay, so uh, this is one particular case where we are doing a pre-lacrimal approach. I think you do that if you are, if all other techniques fail, right? Yes. Okay, so we just make an incision like that about the inferior turbinate and then chisel off this bone there. Okay, then you put the coat section inside. So that's a pre lacrimal window, that's a nasal lacrimal duct. And now you get the approach to the corners, like the alveolar recess. And I think nobody told about the inferior metal wash. Do some, does somebody practice that? Like that you put the suction into the inferior matrix or debrader, the curved debrader blind into the inferior matrix and then do the debridement. Uh, Hitesh? No, sir. I do, uh, do CFT sometimes. Okay. Well, actually, all the things are all we reserve only for the attachment of an androgonal poly. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, but, uh, but rarely, I just I had to do this pre lacrimal approach for the fungus in the alveolar recess of maxilla. So it, is, it is not that there is something that will not come at all. Actually, if you are uh, you are very busy, like uh, you know how we do in, uh, in Madras Medical College, we tell them, just leave the fungus, keep watching, it will come out. But the problem is, outside you can't, you can't bleed like that. So you got to, okay. can't reach that place in spite of your uh, uh, rad one point two blades and things like that, then you got to do a pre lacrimal approach. Ah, that's it, okay. <laughs> I've used yes, sir. a couple of patients, the uh, canine force and rost me for these cases, mm -hmm. through which you can wash and it comes out through your white meat oil. White meat oil. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right, right. That is one approach you can use sometimes. Okay. Professor Omura, anything different from your side? I think you sometimes do the the Denkes window. You just open, you do the Denkes appro approach and we make a small window, right? Professor Omura? Yes. Yeah. But basically, the, for the fungus, we I don't do the denker procedure, so okay. I I try to preserve everything. So even even I will do the, even I will add the procedure until the maybe uh pre lacrimal approach. Okay, so you do the you even don't do the pre lacrimal approach. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So how do you get the adamant fungus which is lodged in the alveolar recess? What is your yeah, so to get that? Uh, as a, as a method of the gauze, I I just try to how to say the gauze dissection. That is a, how to say I I'm I'm very very how to say, interesting point that that's I try to how to say remove, uh, mm -hmm. uh, to to avoid the like uh to avoid the damage of the fungus. So I try to remove as a um unblock, like uh, if unblock. you. You, if you don't penetrate the fungus, then it is uh, easy to. So you know. go go around the capsule of the fungal ball, right? Yeah, exactly, sometimes, exactly. And especially the, from not, the media. Not always possible. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, okay. but uh, that is my how to say interesting point. Like uh, oh oh today I can I can remove completely. Oh, so I'm very happy. Something like that. Okay, right. So the ah uh, maybe the next slide. Ah, uh, see, uh, this is actually one interesting point. You sometimes get cases like that, you know, a small uh, sort of recess, deep recess in the alveola like that. Uh, and it's going actually well below the level of the nasal cavity like that. So do you do a uh, cardinal look approach or you go for some other approach for these sort of cases, say fungus lodged in a recess like that? You can see there's a sort of septation there, say deep recess, very narrow recess. I think Hitesh, you have a lovely video of this sort of alveolar uh, recess. Yes, yes, sir, I yes, sent yes. to you. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Okay. Uh, maybe now this scenario is a very tricky scenario. Can you? This patient had a orbital bloat fracture a couple of months back, and now there is maxillary sinusitis. So, how do you approach this case, Ramandeep, sir? Uh, what is the complaint of the patient? Uh, cheek pain, no cheek discharge, cheek pain. I mean, that can be a spin-off of the, uh, you know, um, uh, orbital injury or a facial trauma also. Um, mm -hmm. 
many patients will live with sinusitis like this and it will not uh, do anything. Uh, but if there is a muscle entrapment uh, and the patient has uh, diplopia or other things, then of course you can uh, go ahead, uh, repair this and uh, clear the maxillary antrum uh, on its own. So for the sinusitis, you can just leave it like that? Yeah. I mean, uh, if the patient is having no complaints, this patient will present to us for trauma, not for sinusitis. That's for sure. Okay. Because it is, uh, you know, with the blowout like that, you can see the contents in the maxillary antrum. A major mm -hmm. part of the wall is gone. Um, I mean, I'll need to see a sagittal scan to see how is uh, the damage anterior to posteriorly. Uh, you can just, uh, you know, kind of, it's not that we would go and just clear the sinus and not do anything for the uh, blowout. Because if we don't, it is going to come back again. That's a massive uh, chunk of tissues that is lying in the maxillary sinus. So how do you go if the patient has like chronic nasal discharge and the patient has some sinusitis complaints? So how do you operate this sinus then? Uh, do you do a complaint surgery? Yeah. I would probably combine it. Uh, I mean, if he has diplopia or, um, uh, you know, uh, the eyeball has kind of um, uh, gone in, I would... Um, uh, Take my and depending on how it's interior posteriorly, um, we'll probably take help of my ophthalmology colleague. They have those um, blocks which they uh, the plates which they biopore plates which they insert, and once that is out of the way, uh, it's called a combined approach. We have a few cases uh, like this which we have published, and then uh, just uh, drain away the maxillary antrum, a nice wash, and uh, it needs ventilation. Sinusitis is happening because there is blockage of ventilation. Okay. So let me come to Andy, sir. Let me put a tricky question for you, sir. So suppose this patient is not interested for any orbital repair and you are to drain the sinusitis. So how do you go ahead, sir? No, sir, I don't get you. This patient doesn't have? The patient is not interested for an orbital blood fracture repair and he just wants to cure his sinusitis. This is the same thing. No, no. That is, you got to uh, use an angle scope, do a good vancinectomy, Check for the uh, the wall. I think the wall is intact. Or if you put a part of the superior part of the insulator, let's find the place, go and take it out. Okay. So, any difference in opinion? Yes. Any yeah. in opinion from and just, uh, yeah. If, yeah. If, yeah. if person interested, clean the sinus. Definitely you clean, but uh, at least keep pack. Mirosel pack into the maxillary antrum at least uh, five days or six days. Ah, okay. to, the, to prevent okay. any prolapse or something, yes. Okay, okay. This type of case I have uh, done few days back, basically. Okay, uh, maybe you, you can also put a Foley's catheter and inflate the Foley's balloon into yes, the Yes, 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 also. But we have to, you know, uh, two, two, two uh, Sorry right. to interrupt. Uh, yeah, know, yeah, why, yes, would we expect, uh, why would we expect a prolapse? Why would it happen? Uh, no, basically, uh, that patient's have a uh, slight bit of, you look, this patient also, Mm -hmm. So some trauma is there, no? If I remove, there is a chance of uh, lower part, slight bit of uh, down will be there, no? So uh, by chance, uh, any support system from the pathology, so if I remove, then there is a chance of slight bit of prolapse. I mean, so if, if you, you accidentally during surgery remove some support, that's what you mean, right? Yes, yes, yes. 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 So okay. if you uh, accidentally enter and dislodge the bone, which yeah, is there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That's, that's what I'm saying, yeah. So support to the bone also required at that time. We removed this bone accidentally during surgery because it's very tricky surgery. You can just poke inside the orbit accidentally, right? So I think maybe Omura would go to the infirmatus. Professor Omura, yeah. in this case. Yeah. So I I prefer I and maybe some of maybe all of you don't understand my approach, but the Dharma approach. What that, is that? that is a direct approach to the anterior and the lateral wall of this uh, maxillary sinus. So it means uh, how to say you can you can access the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus by endoscope. Uh, uh, it I is think kind I, of I can the endoscopic. That. Probably you put the dentcus. Yeah. No, no, dentals, no, no. Dentcus, right? Uh, dentcus is a you have to remove the uh, uh, piriform aperture. Yeah, so but means, you, you put the kind of endoscopic all the way look uh, approach. For the same dead case of exposure with a small window there, right? Preserving the piriform aperture. Is that the same? It's, uh, so pre pre preserve the preform, uh, preform aperture, but uh, just uh, open just a small up the hole there. Hole yeah. Over there. Yeah, exactly. That, that is a very nice approach to the, if the, uh, how to say, orbital floor that going down from the anterior part, then mm -hmm. the Dharma approach is a very good uh, way to uh, reconstruct for, for the reconstructions. But, okay. but how, do, how do you maintain the ventilation? ventilation. Yes. Yeah. 
Because You can make the connection through the, how to say, through the natural oceans of the maxillary. As Vinod sir, you showed uh, nasalization of maxillary sinus. Yeah. I think yeah. it is the yeah. answer, I think, in this it's case. It's the answer for this thing. Yes. Ah, yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, that's a radical surgery, but probably that's a. But, but option. in this yeah, case, yeah. what will you do? Okay. okay, okay, that's right, yeah. that's right. That's yeah. the answer. On this. If you got to persuade him to go for a, uh, the blow factor repair. Yeah, okay. Tell you right. advantages. And it will uh, tell you, you know. Yes, yes, yes. Probably you can we can convince the patient about the repair of the blow up fracture and then go with the combined procedure. That's a that's the best possible way. But then or else probably I never thought of the nasalized system, but that's a good idea. It's a fantastic idea, I think, for this patient. Yes, yes. Yes. Sir, the uh cycle is cross uh cycle is coming near so there is a heavy rain here one thing second you have fully from the skull base again so thinking of uh um uh, uh modified dental for almost all cases <laughs> okay no no but what omuro said is also right you can do the window there pre-lacrimal remove the entire unsinate process and feel turbinate that's a good way but then uh maybe uh i wouldn't do like that and I never thought about the nasalization button. That's a good way for this patient, probably. And uh, yes, so let's go to the ethmoids now. Let's finish the maxillary sense and go to the ethmoids now. See, this is actually, this is the pre-op scan on the left side and the right, you are seeing the post-op scan. And you can see this is a good surgeon. He had done all the, removed entire septations there. But then again, for him, there is some complication. Can somebody comment on this complication? And how do you avoid that? Ramandeep, sir, I think you're staying... Silent for some time now. How do you avoid this? <laughs> okay. How do you avoid this complication? I honestly, I really don't know what's happening. If you can, can you see the middle turbinate there? Yeah. So yeah. Somebody did a good ethmoidectomy. It's a nice, it's a good surgeon. It's nicely done. Oh, you mean course. it's lateralized? Yeah. So how do you avoid that during your ethmoid surgery? So um, uh, what we call what was uh, older uh, in older older times was called the Bolgerization. Uh, it's called a controlled sinusia technique in uh, the modern terminology. Uh, part of the lateral uh, middle part of the middle terminate is uh, made bare and the septum and they are made to uh, kind of stick together. But that being said, even in the best hands, turbinate lateralization. Is one and sinusia are one of the commonest, commonest post-operative face complications. If it happens, you have to end up opening it. Otherwise, there's going to be disease formation. There's going to be lack of drainage. Your douches are not going to go into the nasal cavity, and it's going to happen. So, uh, as protocol, we do a controlled sinusia technique in all patients. And if we see the space is limited, we just trim like two cuts with a through cut the interior part of the middle turbinate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, I so, think second point, what we could do is we have to preserve the horizontal attachment of the middle turbinate there. That is okay. something like as a, as a pillar to make it rigid so that it doesn't come from the plate. You mean that a shelf of bone there like that? Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, maybe uh, uh, Tushar sir. Yeah, Tushar sir. Yeah. Yes, yes. With all efforts, sometimes I have seen still uh, lateralization. I think no. this is the most happening and uh, most uh, and uh, unhappy moments of the surgeon. No, We've done good job by lateralization of the middle turbinate. To avoid, mm -hmm. we have done everything: polarization, stitching, uh, gel form placement. Still, sometimes there. So uh, that is the happen. And also, I think um, checking off uh, there after uh, follow up is very important. If uh, you think this problem is there, then I I now uh, in my institute we do now if uh, middle turbinate not stabilized lower part of the middle turbinate I um, sacrifice, yes. then okay. problem uh, slight bit of less I think this is my experience. Okay, you yes. see definitely your experience. Uh, wow. Anthony sir, Anthony sir, your comment. So one is uh, this is uh, for a case this is the uh, ideal scenario to. Uh, picture your juniors 
because usually the suction parents when they don't do it properly and uh, the mucosal degradation is not there this happens second thing is what i do is i keep a mucosal pack in the middle meatus for 5 to 7 days so this we uh, you take out the pa uh, pack the chances for mucosation is little less compared with the uh, normal cases and uh, when you operate you got to be very meticulous on the foot mucosal injuries and uh, don't injure the uh, the basal lamella on its lower part so that it will have a little bit of stability okay so uh, let's go to the next scan now see uh... The scan like that, a breeze, uh, orbit, and skull base. So um, maybe, uh, Professor Omura, how do you proceed in this patient? If you have a scan like that, there's an orbital breach, the skull base breach. So uh, your your tips in doing Edmodic in this patient for the younger generation? Yeah, so this is my favorite. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, but the first is for the draft procedure. Ah. Yeah, so for, for this kind of patient, you have to <laughs> use the <laughs> right? All India and half India to to buy Slayer to Kunsan or Slayer? Something. Some, some, back, some background noise. Yeah, Dr. Gautam. <laughs> Gautam, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, anyway, okay. Yeah, okay let's, maybe yeah. you, can, you can hear my voice, right? Yeah, yeah. So, drill. So for the drill, uh, then I have to say the amount of the amount of the water is very very important. Okay. And uh, when you use the drill of the Mediterranean company, mm -hmm. then the default the volume of the water, the default is maybe five millimeter, five millimeter, ten millimeter, something like that. Okay. But uh, if you use the M five. M5 drill. Then, okay. if you increase the volume ah. until 80, okay. So if you increase the 80, the irrigation is a much I'd say bigger. Okay. Then uh, the water just wash out the bone, everything. So you even the uh, for this for for this patient, the bleeding comes out from the uh from the tumors. The uh, ossifying fibroma, so just comes out the uh, bleeding, and also, okay. yeah. But the uh, the water just wash out everything, and you always can detect the uh, behind the bone. Okay, right? so, so sort of, it, so you yeah, use plenty of water, patient, right? You have right. to you have to see the periosteum the orbit. You have uh -huh. to see the dura. You have to remove the, all of the bone. Uh, as mm -hmm. much as possible. Right, at, right. at that time, if you no, increase uh, okay. the volume of the, of the water, then uh, it's okay. very, very helpful. Okay. So, Pavan, uh, uh, this, this probably is, say it's a fungal allergic AFRS. And, uh, how do you prevent uh, walking into the orbit in this sort of patients? How do you prevent orbital injury during your surgery, Pavan? Pavan, you are not audible. You are muted, I think. You are muted. First thing, I will use navigation in this patient. So navigation? navigation okay. Is yeah, is one thing which I, and I'll do by bit by bit, cell by cell, I'll go. And I'll see it again, wash, see it again, then open up one more area. So okay. bit by bit you go, you keep medial inferior and then go bit by bit. So this is how okay. you can approach this case. And okay. I think it is doable. It is doable. Okay, right. So, uh... It says, this, yes, this, say this uh, patient is blind on the left eye. This, say this patient is blind on the left eye. And right is the only seeing eye. Will you operate or not? Uh, yes, sir. I will, of course, operate, sir. You will, of course, operate. Okay. Yeah, yes, sir. So, and, sir, it is a case makes of... makes you so confident here? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. It is a case of... Uh, so, what and... makes you so confident in operating this patient? Uh, okay. Sir, it's, it's on the case of, right? It is a case of fungal sinusitis, sir. So, we have to operate, sir. Okay, so but so, patients only 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 seeing a only seeing a is the right eye. So if something happens on that eye, that's finished. It's blind on both eyes. So how do you prevent an orbital injury here? Uh sir, uh, as Dr. Pawan says, uh, we have to remove bit by bit fungus and uh, near the orbit, 
near the area of the sir in in case of fungal sinusitis is always dura is uh, dura and periosteum is intact okay. intact yeah that's yeah. a good point so yeah it is a very important intact. point okay so we have to uh, uh, dissect as in maxillary sinus we have to dissect uh, with uh, merosil and pressure with uh, suction tip and merosil okay in that important area i think okay. most of the research, sir uh, that patients video of uh, inferior alveolar recess cell uh, yeah, same, yeah. same, same thing. Same, same, right, same right, CT scan right. was there. Okay, so okay. I had removed uh, fungus, fungus over the exposed uh, lamina periosteum with uh, a merosil dissection. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, Ramandeep sir, I think it's you. Do you have some difference in opinion or the same? Uh, so uh, more or less. Uh, see, if this is AFRS uh, number one, we don't need to worry about it too much because it is very like. AFRS is pandemic in our area. That is what we majorly uh, do. Okay. <laughs> and it is very, I don't remember the last time I've seen when there's a periorbital breach. Okay. okay. And uh, it can uh, go through the lamina papyracia. It presses the eyeball. Patient presents with massive proptosis, but the periorbita is resistant to, uh, uh, you know, uh, AFRS. Mm -hmm. So once that area is opened, once you gently push the eyeball in, the muck comes into the nasal cavity. I mean, you push the eyeball, okay. Yeah, and you okay. just push the eyeball. The muck is going to, it's just going to mobilize and move into your field and you uh -huh. can just suction and wash it out. Secondly, okay. like you were asking if someone is not confident, again, all these cases require graded, uh, you know, training and approach. If I'm a younger surgeon or a novice, this is not the first case I would be doing. Okay. It, okay. Uh, you need to uh, realize that this is a tough case because bone is not there and with the powered instrument, it's easy to go through the uh, periorbita. If you do that, fat is going to come out. The disease will be even tougher to take out than what it was primarily. So take a senior's help or refer uh, it to a patient or yes, to a surgeon who can, uh, you know, do it better. It's a very and nice point. Your pass are nice. doing cases like this. Um, uh, you know, I know Pavan does a lot of these. So it's not something uh, which is, uh, you know, not uh, uh, doable. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a case. Yes, it's, you have to be patient. Uh, you have to, uh, you know, give preoperative steroids so that there is a lot of shrinkage uh, of the uh, polyps and uh, the um, uh, fungal muck so that it makes it easier for you to operate. Okay. Uh, also, many times you would see that the skull base is eroded and we get scared that the skull base, that's not the skull base getting eroded. It's majoritarily what we call partial volume averaging, which happens on uh, CT scans. It's one of the artifacts of the CT. Okay. okay. So, uh, uh, Tushar, sir, uh... That's actually say a lot of good comments from uh, your side, Ramandi sir. Thank you. So, Tushar sir, maybe these patients see a uh, revision polyp and you can see the antithema artery hanging there. How do you avoid a complication? Because you can always get a nightmare like that. So, what are your tips in avoiding an antithema artery bleed in this sort of patients? Tushar sir, are you there? Are you left for the dissection? Or maybe, Anthony sir, can you Throw some insights here. This is a antiretinal artery bleed. The problem comes only when you don't recognize it. And uh, once it is goes in, uh, inside the uh, 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 how, how, how do you prevent it? How do you prevent it bleed in this sort of patients? Like the artery hanging in the masonry like that. In a, in a revision patient. How do you prevent the bleed, sir? So, we do all the colors. When you go go near that, you enter the uh, uh, posterior mic, find the skull base there. From there, you just come anteriorly and uh, be careful around that uh, anteriorly artery area. And if you already could, uh, could locate the, the frontal sinus with the, uh, the frontal sovia and the posterior skull base, in between that area, be careful when you are removing uh, it. If you see artery, portrait it first and then you, uh, you dissect it. Okay. It's a good point. Uh, have anybody got a complication like that? Hitesh, Dr. Hitesh, have you ever no. had a... No? Yeah, no Pavan, sir. sir. Dr. Pavan, you got? Okay, good. How many times? Only once? Okay, well, so I, I I got two times probably. <laughs> and maybe... I know that. Uh, you want me to show that picture of a canthotomy canthalyzer? Yeah, I, I, I want that. Probably I will just... Like I will just finish in another 10 minutes and we'll have the videos. Right. So, you know, actually, you know, one patient, I got a complication after surgery. I did the surgery, I left the OT, I saw the orbit. I was going back to my home and then I got a call like there's a retrobulbar hemorrhage when the patient was coughing and straining. So, even that can happen, you know. Maybe how you manage that. Yes, the lateral, that's, the, the lateral that's the problem, Louis. 
okay maybe can we have the so video ramandeep sir can we have your video for how do you manage it can we i can just stop sharing if you don't mind this nice to have the video now itself ramandeep sir can you share your screen okay there we go ramandeep sir please unmute uh, yourself unmute yourself ramandeep sir Ramandeep sir please unmute yourself Ramandeep sir your body i think your audio is muted okay so anyway you can see the retrouble bar hemorrhage there mm -hmm. so uh, we have done a canthotomy but the procedure is not complete without a cantholysis even after cantholysis the orbit was still tense so uh, and the pupil was becoming uh, sluggish so we went ahead because this is a, a tumor surgery we were doing basically and you can see the cautery marks here we were trying to cauterize the vessel it was a no go and we went uh, decided to go ahead with a canthotomy and a cantholysis we can't see that uh, video we yeah, are just, we are just seeing that so, okay. okay okay you cannot see yeah no, we, no, are no, we are just just seeing your like vascular injuries in endoscopic endonesis as we with your name We were seeing the video before, yeah. Now, we... no. yeah, yeah. Now we can play again. So can... no, we don't see the video. Uh, yeah. You, you... No. Now we are seeing. Yeah, yeah. Now we are seeing it. We can see that. Again, go on. Is yes. keep the slide again. Okay. Slide uh... two. Slide two. The video. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Okay. So we uh, we did a uh, so this procedure is not complete. It is canthotomy and cantholysis. Canthotomy is the cut we made uh, to approach the uh, tendon, and then we do the cantholysis. Even after that, the orbit was tense. Uh, I couldn't go, so we went in. Uh, we uh, this was a tumor uh, surgery we were doing. You can see the cautery. I have been trying to uh, cauterize the vessel, but it had retracted. It was a no go. and we decided to go ahead with a canthotomy cantholysis even that was not enough so then we did a orbital decompression uh, because uh, we were right there in the field so once the fat uh, is kind of pushed out you can see we give slight pressure on the orbit and the fat pops out that releases the pressure on the orbit so same day uh, evening um, uh, you can see the cut which is a couple of days later he man uh, that is about 2 weeks later the cut has healed and uh, the eyes uh, okay and that panda sign has uh, gone okay so let me ask you a question sir uh, see uh, if the if you are still there in the ot would you straight away take the patient to ot and do a endoscopic decompression or you go for a canthotomy and cantholysis canthotomy cantholysis is always the uh, you know the first because that you can do in a pre op also okay but then you are in the ot you can just shift it like in the 20 minutes and do the surgery also Agreed. but then uh, breaching the uh, periorbita removing the uh, wall it is an added uh, step and uh, it is always step wise uh, you still have a couple of minutes okay right. and uh, you know uh, just do and can thought me cantholysis uh, it does not take very long uh, i mean this was an unedited video i mean it's an under a minutes job okay, you know, okay. one more thing uh, you have to do it in pre op or post op because the time is important if it is increasing so much it can compress the optic nerve yeah yeah it will be gone or yeah. optic nerve will be gone then optic nerve compression for a few minutes can be disastrous so i think it is a good idea to do a canthotomy and then shift the patient in the ot yeah okay. and if it is in the ward then canthotomy cantholysis is the best bet you will have right there okay so you can take some uh, Two three um, um, vent plants, large vent plants, put uh, between the uh, the periorbita and the bone from outside, and take out that. Uh, they say keep the cannula till you shift the patient to the theater. That will reduce the the pressure a little bit after uh, the uh, lateral cannulotomy and injury. Injury uh, can. Sir, sir, I didn't get you. Can you come again? How do you put the vent plant like? You put the IV line uh, into the orbit. Uh, 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 vents and cannulas, large ones. Okay. Palpate the the walls, bony walls. Okay. 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 So it's like it's to the to the bony wall, and they take out that uh, that needle through the cannula. The few drops of blood will come out. 
So that you took two, three days, two, three, and then shift the patient because not always you can immediately take the giving the patient to the table. You can buy little more time. Okay. Then when you do a cantalysis and a lateral cantalysis and initial cantalysis, in spite of the difference, tense, you can do that. That's a good idea. Okay. So maybe you can just run through the next subsequent slides because we are running short of time. So let's come to spinoid now. And you sometimes get patients like this. No CT shows a dehiscence. Optic, uh, I see all this bone is around is decent. And how do you go ahead in this sort of patients? Uh, maybe can I start with uh, is Tushar sir there? No, maybe uh, Pavan sir. Yeah. Okay. So, how do you go uh, ahead in this patients? The the most important thing is first thing is read the scans well. Okay. okay. Second thing is always always this is a basic fundamental. You should be seeing the tip of your instrument always. Whenever you are okay. operating, okay. Don't use the powered instrument laterally and and superiorly in these cases. That okay. is third thing important, and fourth is city navigation. Mm -hmm. That is, I think, important. So uh, you have not to be blind anywhere, and make it a wide opening. Do a good poshyath wide acne. Make a wide corridor. Go there. Do a good spinal dot me. A good wide open spinoid or okay. even if required, you 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 remove the rostrum of a spinoid, spinoid. and mm -hmm. and make it a wide opening and do it. Okay, Dr. Hitesh, uh, any difference in your opinion from your side? Uh, no, sir. Say yes. and use uh, I think use uh, uh, merosil or ghost dissection there. Don't use uh, instrument. Don't pull any okay. tissue over that area with forceps. So I can understand that you do a lot of revision cases and somebody refers a CT scan like this and a patient to you. So how do you go ahead in this particular patient, this CT scan? Have a close look at the CT scan. What is your next line of management in this patient? You straight away go for the surgery. I think I would come to everyone probably this particular question. This patient is there and you are asked to operate upon this patient and probably in a conference or you get this patient referred to you. So how do you go ahead? So if this case is given to you in a conference, understand a conference. Okay, no. Understand that the organizers don't like you. Don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So okay. Second is what just... pathology, uh, what pathology are we dealing with? If it is AFRS, again uh, give a, a preoperative steroids. Don't no, you don't the... you don't know. Just see a CT scan like that. You don't know, right? You see some heterogeneous opacity and the CT scan like that. Right. Okay. So, so like Paul had said, open the face of the sphenoid wide because there is nothing on the face of the sphenoid except the posterior septal branch from the sphenopalatine artery. That is the only, uh, you know, and that you can cauterize, take away, drill out the rostrum of the sphenoid, make a wide opening like you do for pituitary surgery and then start... Uh, the you know gently if it's just a biopsy you're doing you can start in the midline pick a biopsy don't go laterally as Pavan said secondly if it is AFRS AFRS doesn't stick to the internal carotid or the optic nerves because okay. the cadherins and adherins are different they are from they are different pathologies they are not going to integrate uh, with each other give a lot of wash lot of cleaning and uh, you know always have the tip of your instrument uh, in vision. Right. And I think, uh, and again, experience, uh, This uh, these cases are for experienced surgeons. We need to have insight to know what we are capable of uh, doing and pulling off. Uh, luck doesn't uh, support you all the time. So that is uh, that would be a message to the youngsters. And take okay. a senior surgeon's help. Uh, I mean, it's not that this, these cases are not doable. Okay. Well, so any difference in opinion? It's actually a lot of valid inputs there. But is there anything more to add? Uh, sir? If it is a for us, you sir, sir, you don't know. You just don't know. You just see a CT scan, heterogeneous opacity, and this is this is a CT scan. You see, you don't know what the pathology is. I have uh, recently done about uh, three months back. I done a case like this. Uh, we made a diagnosis of adenocarcinoma because everything has got eroded and everything was there. And uh, as you said, we saw the patient on table. Put an endoscope inside, you know it's only an AFRS. So open it up, 
Ever is not going to breach Dura or is not going to, to breach any, any one of these, uh, these arteries and, uh, and nerves. So, if it is an A for us, there is nothing B. If it is uh, other pathology, uh, without taking, uh, taking biopsy and knowing what type of uh, pathology going inside for treatment is not very advisable. And if you think it is, uh, you want to uh, preserve optic now, then you have to shift the oxy optic now before the tumor. Put the, uh, find the optic now uh, outside and then place from there. Similarly, for uh, uh, take that uh, internal carotid artery uh, the, at the at the paraclinal regions, and from there you be careful and they don't injure the uh, ICA. So uh, actually, so when you see a CT scan like that, it can be it can be a tumor, AFRS, and you must also remember that even an pseudoaneurysm can present like that. And sometimes this actually is not a pseudoaneurysm. Once you, if, if it is created a pseudoaneurysm, you get a bleeding like that. So, so I see even I see a bleed is possible. So I think uh, we should always go for a uh, MRI and sometimes a contrast CT so that we can differentiate uh, aneurysms or maybe tumors, and then we can go ahead because. Many times I operate with just with a CT scan, but that's not a. You may sometimes end up, end up with a ICA bleed like that. So, uh, what do you feel, uh, Ramandeep sir? Am I correct in saying that? You are, you are, you are, you are, you are muted, muted, sir. Muted, sir. Yeah. So, uh, my, my video on the ICA, you know, is a similar, uh, you know, uh, advice uh, to uh, fellow surgeons that uh, when we did optic nerve decompression, we used to just go on the basis of CT scan. Um, but a CT, uh, uh, MRI would show if there's a pseudoaneurysm, it would show a flow void, which can be, uh, you know, picked up and help you diagnose it's a pseudoaneurysm. And the video I have, uh, these are the points, um, uh, you know, uh, we cover and how we manage that ICA bleed uh, with the help of uh, interventional radiology. Okay. So maybe since we are running out of time, I can, I think I can skip the frontal sense and should go to the videos from all your sites and then That's if fine. time permits, I'll go for the, for the talk. So maybe, uh, Dr. Kidesh, can you share your screen on the NLD injury? Because NLD is a very basic thing. I don't want to speak on hi-fi stuff like ICA blade and all those things because many youngsters are watching us. So common things first. So Dr. Kidesh, can you share your uh, screen? Sir, on please, a, uh, yeah, please stop, stop share. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, one minute. I'll stop share. Okay, yeah. So it is visible. Yeah, I'm seeing you. Uh, this is a case of uh, entrocoinal polyp. Uh, there was a wide um, maxillary ostium, mm -hmm. and while uh, I try to remove the unseen it from here with debrider. Okay. Okay. I injured the nasolacrimal duct here. Mm -hmm. No, so clear. Okay, okay, okay. So okay. now my question is, sir, how to uh, manage this? How to, to manage, manage the injury? Uh, yeah. Professor Omura, are what you there? What to do, sir? In this I case, I got a question. Professor Omura? Yes, 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 yes. So, uh, yeah. did you get his question? So he accidentally injured the NLD there. How do you manage this now? This is uh, how to say, I, so from the movie, uh, what, what? This is a uh, orbit. You, uh, I think I think that's the orbit. Yeah. I think it's, a, it's actually angled endoscopy or looking. No, no, sir. That, no, sir. No, that was not orbit, sir. Okay. This is nasal lacrimal. I, I cannot. Yeah, from the. Uh, I don't even actually. I, I don't, cannot uh, understand. Oh, uh, okay, okay. So this is where is NLD? Can you come again? Yes. Ah, there, there. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So that's a very wide maxillary sinus opening, and here damage the NLD there superiorly yes, there. Sir. Yes, sir. That was not where, orbit. Where sir. is the? Yeah. Where is the? I cannot understand that. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. Is the, this, 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 one, this is a yeah. maxillary sinus. This is a maxillary sinus opening. Yes. White maxillary sinus. This is the view opening. of seventy degrees, sir. Seventy degree endoscope. This is the maxillary sinus left side, and there is your injury there. Is this another lacrimal duct? Yes. Yeah, sir. that's another left side. Yeah. Yes. 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 Sir. Right. 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 Yes. So and how do you manage uh, it? And you injured by debrider, by debrider or by uh, forceps? Micro debriders, yeah, micro micro mm -hmm. I think, uh, how to say, you don't have to do that. This is a very small, like a uh, injury, and you don't have to do the uh, DCR. Mm -hmm. I just, even you leave it, 
then sir what sir what say? is the advice to patient no no uh, you, one is you, one so you just you, need, you, uh, you can leave it like that uh, post yeah, yeah post operative you, the nasal drip yeah post operative uh, advice i drip i drip i drip and the massage then it's okay ocular massage okay ocular yeah, massage yeah. okay okay yeah. then Two sex weeks, syringe it's okay so no need to do a dcr no, no need to do it no, no need to do a dcr no need. i think no need okay and doing a dcr also is such an easy job there you can mm -hmm. just open the soft tissue and a bone around and leave it open that's it okay uh, that is one way yeah. okay so uh, you can also do a dcr you can i think probably as umura said he doesn't feel that it's necessary <laughs> what about uh, other panelists uh, Take the paper, cut off on the testing and then just uh, lay it open. You can just widen it and lay it open like that. Okay. Yeah, sir. Uh, any is is a stent required? Do you do you put a stent in this sort of patients? No. No. Don't do it because uh, if you are if this fails, you can always do a do a DCR easy job. Okay. Okay. So, uh, like sir. In in all medial maxillectomies, angiofibromas, we do we don't put a stand there. Yeah, it open. It is okay. left open. You make a you make an oblique cut with a clean scissors with a scissors, mm -hmm. and it is always open. You don't okay. need to do anything with that. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay, right. So it's a wide opening there. I can see a wide opening at the tears freely flowing. So probably nothing is required. Yes. So uh, can you go to the next video, Hitesh? Your next CSF leak video. Yes, yes. Sir. Sir, in this video, while uh, searching the spinoid uh, sinus, I had injured the uh, posterior ethmoid. Most posterior skull part, most post skull base of the most posterior part of the ethmoid roof. Ah, there. Okay, you can you can okay. see the CSF leak there. Okay, yeah, okay. Sir. Yes. Sir. So, so my my question is, how to prevent uh, such type of CSF leak while uh, searching the spinoid to all panelists? Okay, Professor Omura. So how do you avoid a CSF leak? Uh, once you're trying to open the spinoid sinus, mm. here actually he was working through the ethmoids. He was trying to open the spinoid, but then he accidentally poked into the skull base. This sometimes yeah, I... can happen in revision cases. So how yes, do you yes, avoid and, that? Uh, yeah. So from that, how to say? Just, just basic, basically, maybe the how to say this webinar. There are very beginners, uh, ENT doctors also. Uh, mm -hmm. listen so basically if you open up something like uh, open up sphenoid open up maxillary open up the uh, frontal you okay. have to show at least two anatomical landmarks once you, when you puncture something you have to show two anatomical landmarks within the endoscopic view because mm -hmm. if you don't show any anatomical landmark then i even for for example even I see this endoscopic view, but sometimes I misunderstand where is the where. So okay. because in the endoscopic view, there is nothing. Like okay. there is no anatomical landmark. Mm -hmm. So I think it's better to show at least, for example, this endoscopic view, you cannot understand any anatomical landmark. Okay, so you have to, get a, you have to come out, get a panoramic view, get more oriented and see what yes. is... What is before, what is after, and then you open the area, exactly. right? Exactly. Right. And then okay. you can understand how rotate the endoscopic view is. Ah, so okay, okay. At right, least right. two, not one, two. Mm -hmm. Then you can understand, you can fix the how, how rotate. Mm -hmm. That okay. is a very, very basic thing. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, any difference in opinion, uh, Ramandeep, sir? How do you avoid a CSF leak in sir, such you, scenarios? Can Injuries can, that can happen. They will happen. It's very common for even sir, can, surgeons sir, to can become you... dis disoriented. And uh, again, uh, when opening a sphenoid, always uh, you know uh, have the nasal floor uh, in view, have the coana in view, and uh, uh, don't poke blindly. I mean, that is the only advice we can give uh, newcomers. So at least uh, if you are, it's we, uh, you know, when we angulate the endoscope upwards, uh, disorientation uh, happens. And then we think that we are still looking head on, but actually we are looking superiorly, your angulation changes and uh, the slope of the scalp is, it's different for different patients. 
So that can also uh, lead us into uh, trouble. So I think with Hidesh, probably uh, that's what happened, that uh, there's a, uh, the skull could be, uh, the slope could be excess. Uh, there was disorientation. Instead of going head on, uh, he kind of yeah. went upwards. And this happened, but it's managed very well. I mean, that's the way it has You can see that he managed it pretty so, well. I think, I think Hidesh, I should you... be very grateful that you shared this because, you know, people, they always shy away from sharing their complications. No, Everybody no, gets no. it sort of Every, complicated. Everyone like great complication, so, so you know, thank you again thank you. for sharing. Uh, there is one more way, uh, yeah, more ways uh, pre preventing this injury. One, one to follow that imaginary line from the superior border of the maxillary sinus. Don't go beyond mm -hmm. above that ever. Uh, you mean the, the orbit, the orbit axis, yeah. right? Yeah. The orbit and the second yeah. thing is to see the superior turbinate. Okay. Uh, you have not to go beyond the half, uh, above half. You don't oh, go okay. at the upper half of superior turbinate. Superior turbinate. Okay. Keep, okay. Uh, in close relation to the lower half, and you okay. are there in the smart science. So right. I think that can prevent the injury. Okay, good. So, um, any, uh, Anthony, sir, do you got some video from your side? Is there something you want to share? Some complications, some difficult scenarios? No, I don't have. Okay, so what about Pavan? Uh, no, I didn't. So, I whatever, uh, Tusha. I think I know, I know, I understand, I understand. So, Ramandeep, sir, I think you got some, uh, yes, some something ICA more. Right? Yeah, yeah. Can you you would like to share that? Yes, please. So, uh, just tell me uh, if you can, uh, you know, kind of uh, see it. I'm going full screen now. I can see you. Yeah, we can see you. Yes, we're seeing you. Okay, so this was a case of optic nerve uh, decompression, traumatic optic nerve decompression. We looked at the CT. You can see the arrows pointing towards the yes, fracture, sir. which commonly happens. You know, that's why we are decompressing. Uh, so we saw uh, what we thought was hemosinus, which is again very common after facial yeah. trauma. Yes, and uh, what we forgot to see that the patient was referred from outside. He had already gotten an MRI done. Mm -hmm. And uh, we missed out on the MRI, the flow void. We didn't see the MRI because uh, normally in our practice, we were not doing MRIs uh, for optic nerve decompression. We were just doing a CT scan and taking the patient up for surgery. So uh, left side, optic nerve decompression, straightforward uh, case. That's at least that's what we thought. Uh, we are remedializing the uh, middle turbinate. So once that is done, I will just skip through these parts. Uh, that's the unsinate process. And uh, initial part usually is done by uh, our senior, more senior resident. And again, you can see that, you know, clotted blood coming out from the sinuses. And we are like, this is what is going to be uh, in the sphenoid sinus also. So that's the basal lamella. Uh, we do an unsenectomy. This part, like I said, uh, usually is done by the residents because uh, these are the cases which don't have disease. It's e easy to understand anatomy in uh, these cases. So we did an unsenectomy. So I will just skip that. And then that's the bulla. Uh, we have removed the bulla. We reached the uh, basal lamella. Uh, then I showed them the superior turbinate. And then I was just telling them the various techniques that can be used uh, for uh, sinus surge, uh, for sphenoid sinus. We have the medial corridor or we have the lateral corridor. So once that is done, again, some hemosinus was encountered. Again, uh, we suctioned it out. We didn't think too much about it. And uh, that's what we discussed, that this is what we saw in the CT scan. Now, that's the last uh, posterior ethmoid cell, a large cell, which can be seen. So this is the superior turbinate. Uh, uh, we are sacrificing part of the superior turbinate because the sphenoid sinus has to be opened wide to be address the, to address the lateral wall because otherwise the instruments are going to uh, clash with each other. Once that is done, I showed them the natural ostia and... Uh, I still remember the talks we were having in the uh, operating room that we can either open through the natural ostia or we can open through the stereo uh, ethmoid inferior medially as soon as I touched uh, with a debrider. And boom. <laughs> and the flow was horrendous. Uh, tachycardia, not of the patient, but uh, operating surgeon That's and uh, my assistant. Uh, see, even this suction can't keep up with it. So we went ahead. Uh, we are using a now a two-surgeon forehand technique. We used a much thicker suction to uh, divert the flow away from the endoscope. Because if your endoscope keeps on getting dirty, uh, you are not going to end up seeing anything. Right? So we just tried to press that. We have not opened the sphenoid wide. So we thought that if we push in a pack, we are going to compress the bleed. 
but uh, as soon as we try to push the pack the pressure is so much that it pushes the pack out but uh, gradually over a few minutes uh, we lost about a liter of blood uh, in the process we were able to pack it tightly and this uh, stopped the bleed patient was intubated interventional radiology was called they said shift the patient down we have a uh, we have a radiology suite already uh, ready and up and running so the patient was wheeled into the interventional radiology they did a ct angio so see the bleed has stopped and uh, this was the ct angio you can see the pseudo aneurysm yeah pseudo aneurysm correct so there were only two options uh, my uh, my interventional radiologist said we'll try the coil first if it fails then the flow diverter because the flow diverter is more expensive than the coils but uh, luckily uh, he's really good i mean he was able to coil this and like i said this is a team effort uh, Alone, uh, ENT alone would not have been able to do anything. I also called in my neurosurgeon, uh, you know, just to be sure that uh, what else, what protocol or what else we can do. And that was the coil. Right. So this was three years ago. This is just when COVID had started. And that's look how the coil has occluded the uh, segment. And this is a three year later CT angio. So this is the part where the coils were. It is basically almost normal with a slight, uh, you know, hint, but the patient has not had any bleed or anything else. Uh, he is uh, doing well. And I will also show you the post-operative cavity uh, three years later. That's his post-operative cavity. So this is the case which really uh, gave us... Yeah. Uh, sleepless night it's, it's an eye opener case <laughs> this can happen to anyone right this can so, happen to anyone yeah, yeah. and uh, i think we had just become so cocky that optic nerve decompression i mean you do yeah. it in, so what let's just go in and uh, we failed to see the kind of fracture of the lateral wall it should yeah. have raised an alarm in us so now as protocol we have shifted to ct as well as mri, MRI. prior to optic nerve decompression okay. i think i just we, just we had two scenarios now one is a pseudoaneurysm which was Maybe can AFRS. So it's another case. So MRI for all carotid dysons, a must. Absolutely. Right? So I think it's already time, and I can uh, ask you probably to. I'm sorry that I couldn't touch the frontal sinus, and there is actually post op. I just went halfway. We could just finish half. So maybe we'll <laughs> we have to wind up. So maybe yeah. I need some uh, carry home message from each one of you for the younger generation people who are watching this. So let us start with probably uh, Dr. Hitesh. Uh, Your carry home message, just one yes, or two words for the younger generation. My message to all is, sir, uh, please always do CT scan after uh, giving a antibiotic and steroid for minimum 10 days. Uh, please uh, go thoroughly uh, through CT scan. Okay, then do the surgery. Good. It's a nice message. So, Dr. Pavan, from your side? Uh, I always tell to my residents, don't be fool yourselves okay. that you know each and everything. Read properly, uh, read uh, and uh, uh, develop skills to read the scans well. Okay. Read the theory part, read how to manage the things. Follow the basic principles of PES level by level. Do okay. a lot of category dissections, attend a lot of workshops, see to the YouTube videos, okay. and then go step by step. Don't ever be fool yourselves that you'd know everything and you can do any case. Don't okay. just rush in. Doing that's true. That's so, so true. So true, actually. Uh, Professor Umura, are you still there? Are you? I think it must be around 12 o'clock there. Professor Umura? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, it's still there. Oh, so what, what yeah. is your carry home message for the younger generation? Your carry home message? Like one or two right. points for the uh, younger generation. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, even, even, even the difficult scenario, even the very like a skull based surgery, but the basic is very, very important. So you have to focusing on the, how to improve your basic skill. And uh, mm -hmm. even you are a beginner, but uh, if you calculate your uh, skills, then definitely mm -hmm. five years later, 10 years later, you can be a skull based sergeant. So, okay. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you, thank you. And uh, I think there are a couple of questions. Maybe I can just take one or two of that probably before I wind up from Anthony sir and, okay. So can you, can you just broadly in a, like, one or two minutes say how to approach the frontal sinus because there, there are two questions about frontal sinus and other is about the um yeah maybe the frontal sinus because we couldn't touch that during it during your talk so Anthony sir in two like five minutes maybe maximum how do you approach the frontal sinus frontal sinus is best left alone when there is no disease that you got to always keep in your mind 
If there is a disease, you can do two ways. So the learning surgeons, it's always safer to do it through intact bulla technique. Okay. For a learned surgeon, it's always safer to do a bulla down technique. Okay. So first you read the CT scan properly, okay. see how much is the frontal lesions and uh, where is the frontal osteum and uh, what are the, the cells. So first, uh, first thing is you do a good ancinectomy, mm -hmm. remove the posterior wall of agonacy, try to find out the uh, drainage pattern. Whether it is a median, medial or lateral, as you know, commonest it is the uh, 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 medial drainage. So go uh, posterior and medial, find the osteum, try to take it out and check it out. Uh, you do it with an angle scope. Angle scope, okay. Angle, angle scope, scope read angle. the scans properly, drainage read. pathway, okay. Drainage pathway, then uh, take it out. And uh, uh, always, whenever there is a, I have a type 3 deformed cell, but we are uh, having a cyclone here, a lot of power cell display. Ah, okay, 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 I understand. I know, I know, I know. Okay. Type 3, if there is a, a frontal, the frontal lesion is created, still frontal can be obstructed. So try to locate the frontal sinus, make it wider. And uh, unless it is mandatory, don't do uh, bigger surgeries like uh, draft and other things unless it is absolutely you warranted. Okay. So, thank you, sir. You very well summarize that and maybe one carry home message for the younger generation. Something from your side. Uh, plan very well your, your surgeries. So, uh, it's always safer to go to a to senior in the planning stage then giving the complication and then calling them. So, plan properly. From your, your CT scan, what are you going to do? What are your, your steps and where are you going to stop it? So plan it properly and then you are... Uh, and uh, always keep updating. Learning is lifelong. Okay, that's good. That's so nice. So nice. Actually, uh, now, Ramandeep, sir, uh, maybe you can have... There is some one more question, actually. The post-op management of sinusitis after surgery. Can you, like, in a couple of minutes, touch on that? The post of management after surgery. Okay. Like you, so you still don't do uh, uh, What we do is uh, number one, pre op counseling is very important. You have to talk to the patient and tell him the importance of uh, post operative follow up and uh, post operative uh, medical management, which we are going to give. Uh, we also start nasal douches, even though his nose is full of no, uh, polyps, the wash is not going to get anywhere. But we start nasal douches to get him into the or her into the habit of what it is going to be like post-operatively. It is very important to, uh, you know, kind of uh, kind of uh, let them know the feel of uh, a nasal uh, nasal douche. So they are meant already mentally prepared. Then they go ahead with the surgery. Post-surgery, uh, normally we don't use any nasal packing and we start uh, nasal flushing about, uh, you know, uh, 24 to 48 hours uh, after the uh, surgery. First, it's just with a plain, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, saline and they can just uh, kind of uh, flush out the clots it uh, once the clots are out it actually is uh, you know easier to uh, suction and uh, clean the nose a few times uh, surgery so i usually call them one week post operatively and they are already on nasal douches and then we also tell them this is also explained again pre operatively that there would be times during season change or when you are uh, you know uh, you can have congestion yeah. and uh, the polyps can kind of kind of come back, but you would not require a surgery because uh, your sinuses are already fully open. We would just give you maybe a cycle of uh, oral steroids, uh, depending upon the kind of uh, disease, and uh, that would take care uh, of the of the disease. Uh, many times, once we give the oral steroids for patients who can't tolerate oral steroids and kind of initial shrinkage has taken place. Uh, we give butyrosinide respules uh, diluted in water and they can wash it with that. Uh, again, uh, washing is the most important. Uh, why follow-up is important? Because when they come to us, we can peek in with an endoscope and if there is minimal polyposis, intranasal steroids is going to take care of it. If it's slightly more, uh, you know, then maybe you can give uh, butyrosinide uh, uh, douches. Okay. And if uh, it's complete blockhead, patient can't breathe and... Uh, Intra, uh, I mean, postoperatively, it looks like what it was uh, preoperatively. Then a cycle of oral steroids uh, is given. Now, dosages depends. There is no one particular dosage that it has to be started at one milligram per kg body weight. Uh, uh, many surgeons have their own protocols they follow. 
Uh, some start with 40, 50, 60 milligrams and then slowly taper it down. Some give for two weeks, some give for 10 days, some give for 21 days. There is no defined guideline for that as yet. And I don't think so they will ever be because it's very difficult. Every patient's response is uh, different uh, from uh, the other one. Uh, for younger surgeons, take home messages. It's a steep learning curve. Don't straight away jump to uh, fancy cases like we were showing here, you know, a carotid injury and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Start with good basic work. A good basic work is the building block of what you can do. Uh, second, it also depends on your setup. You might be the most skillful surgeon there is around. If you don't have backup, you don't have ICU, you don't have a good interventionist, there's no point doing these cases because you're going to land into trouble and then no one is going to come and save you. This is not to scare you, but to make you understand what needs to be in place before you, uh, you know, embark upon uh, the fancier surgeries. So good basic surgery, practice that, go watch a few people. No one is perfect, number one. Uh, no one uh, uh, does the, uh, you know, the. No, I mean, no one technique works for everyone. So see a few people, like I learned today that uh, I used to just flush the fungal debris away. I learned uh, Hitesh is using Merosil, you're using a nasal pack to kind of rotate it inside and push things out. So you learn things when you uh, go around and then make a protocol and follow that for yourself. It is not necessarily what works best in your hands is going to work best in my hands or is going to best uh, work best in Dr. Amura's hand. Uh, everyone has their own style of operating. There is no one correct way, but the algorithm needs to be correct. That is what we need to tell the young surgeons. Very, very nice words, actually. I say golden words, actually. So, in fact, I think I can summarize it now. Uh, so, it was actually you know, a, quite a big learning experience for me. I, could, I learned a lot from you all people. A lot of valid inputs. So thank you once again for all your time and coming over. And thank you once again, Professor Omura. It was a nice talk. And thank you, all panelists. Thank you. I think we don't thank have you, further time to continue this panel. So it was nice to meet you all and learn from you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Good night, guys. Bye -bye. Good night. Good night. Uh, Professor uh, Vijay Krishnan, sir, are there? So, uh, Gautam, sir, do you want to? Can you conclude the session? Gautam, sir, is not there. He is there. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry for responding a little late. Uh, Vijay actually is in Poland, so he must be having some continuity uh, connectivity problems. It okay. was a very okay. fruitful discussion. We all benefited. I also learned a lot from your discussions. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Thank you very much and uh, have a good day. And of course, also our uh, Japanese friend. So uh, I was also very impressed, just like Felix, about his use of so little instruments to do his surgeries. I mean, it was so delicately performed with so little instruments. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Have a good day. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Good night. Good night. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Vater, thank you. Thank you.